Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Jank Tank episode number 13. My name is Timothy Zaccanino. I'm going to be host today for y'all. Joining me on the line, we've got the whole team here, Teld and Christopher, up on a Sunday morning to talk about murders at Karlov Manor with me. How's it going, gentlemen? Uh, it was my turn this morning to be significantly late. Uh, we're taking turns, although I actually can't see Teld showing up late. Well, he's all teachery and stuff, so he's like he's like up at six on weekends. So my my oversleeping my oversleeping is still several hours before either of you wake up. So yeah, <laughs> I, I woke up at one thirty in the in the afternoon the other day. This, I mean, it, my God, well, see, I haven't done that in so I, long. See, I don't know. I don't know what's going on because over the course of my entire life, like even if I'm out really really late, like six in the morning late, I pop up at ten. At the absolute latest. That's always been the deal. No matter how badly I want to sleep into the afternoon, I literally can't do it. And I have absolutely no idea what has changed. But this has happened several times recently. And, like, it's got to stop. Because when you get up at 1.30 in the mor- like in the afternoon, like, you're just kind of like, well, day is kind of already toast. I guess I'll screw around for the next Might as well sleep till three. Yeah. You, so. you know, Chris, it, it is possible. You know, you're not 20 anymore. So maybe your body's just telling you to get some sleep. Maybe. Uh, yeah, that's, that's probably it. Well, I'm going to let you guys in on a secret. If you ever want a natural alarm clock, have a kid. <laughs> and then you'll never sleep till 1.30 p.m. ever again. Well, if you did sleep till 1.30 p.m. with an infinite home, probably means the state should come and take them from you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm coming, Rome. Give me another hour. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, good to have everybody on the episode. I thought you guys did a fantastic job with the um, Neo bonus episode or the Neo Reloaded bonus episode that y'all did last week. It was fun to edit that one. Uh, fun, Fun to not be on an episode and still edit it because then everything's fresh for you, right? And I thought you guys handled that quite well. Good, um... Uh, hosting from Chris there, I, I thought you handled that perfectly well. Well, and, you were uh, on the uh, you were on the episode. <laughs> yeah, yes, I was on the episode. I did shoehorn myself in at the end of that episode, but uh, <laughs> yeah, n- nice little cameo there at the end. <laughs> mm-hmm. And tell it, I think you did you you did a great job of like playing my role of like Chris would say something about the rules on a card that isn't exactly correct, and you'd be like, "Well, it doesn't actually work that way." And I was what like, Chris got he misinterpreted got a card or forgot a detail? Uh, you, you, uh, a couple cards, a couple cards. I, I do like the part where you were like going on about how you guys added hotshot, uh, mechanic to Neo and, uh, at, the whole time I was like, the card's just in the set. Right. And then tell, tell was like, uh, hotshot Neo's actually just from Neo. Or, <laughs> yeah. You know, anyway, um, you guys did a great job on that bonus episode and we'll probably try, try to get more bonus episodes out in the near future about different topics, different cubes that we're drafting and stuff like that. But today we are doing our cube review of Murders at Karlov Manor, which uh, comes out a week or so from where we're recording this. We're going to be keeping this pretty high level, looking at the cards that we would personally be interested in in our unrestricted cube, our higher power level historic cube, though we're also going to keep things a little more open-ended and talk about you know, how these cards apply to cube as a whole, because a lot of the cards we're interested are probably also good in more powerful um, environments, more powerful cubes as well. If you want to come try out the new cards with us, you want to get some testing in, you want a cube with some cool guys for free, the Discord is the best place to do that. Wherever you're listening to this podcast, there will be a link to that Discord. Come check it out. We've been popping off drafts of left and right we had what what six or seven last week over just the span of the weekend so much so to the point that we've added additional scheduled drafts to our you know weekly lineup and uh as we are recording this there are people in our main server doing a chaos draft with one another on a sunday morning so th- there's a lot of action going on there and i also want to take a moment to shout out fletcher who has been added as part of our admin team. We've got eyes on the Eastern Hemisphere now. (laughs) Fletcher, I believe, is Scottish, right? Yes. The the empire is expanding. He posted something about a holiday, a Scottish holiday that uh, (laughs) uh, they celebrate that I knew nothing about. So good good to have a little bit of uh, diversity there in our admin team. Enough of the introductory stuff. Murders at Karlov Manor is 
thematically a murder mystery set it's got a clue tie-in in the real world that we're not going to talk about today it's based on ravnica which there's been some complaining about but i think that kind of works <laughs> it was described uh early on as not a guild centric ravnica set like we shouldn't expect this as a ravnica set turns out that was a lie because there's so many multicolor cards and every guild has you know, it's not described as a guild, but the two color pairs have their archetypes and stuff like that. So this is a Ravnica set. It just doesn't have like guild gates and signets and things like that. It, it's it's a Ravnica set <laughs> with clue flavor. I think it was going to be impossible to get a Ravnica set that wasn't multicolor because that's just kind of the, the shtick that yeah. Ravnica has. I do think this is notably less guild focus like the blue white cards are almost exclusively agency cards right as opposed to or the azoria senate or anything Mm -hmm. like that so i i get what they meant but i think they painted a different expectation than some people might have had because i don't think this is a guild set but we weren't getting away from multicolor yeah no it's it's a multicolor set also notable for people who are like drafting or opening packs and stuff like that this is going to change the limited environment this is the first use of the um, the new play boosters that are replacing draft and set boosters. They're being combined together into play boosters. We're not going to get into the details, but one thing that really matters for Cube, especially for our digital Cube and the card pool that we work with, is the list slash special guest slot that shows up in these that kind of takes cards from other sets and weaves them into these play boosters and i believe of the 10 like special guest cards and the longer list cards i believe all of them except for like one or two are making it to arena so we're getting some reprints via these play boosters so the list itself is kind of whatever but the special guest slots in particular are going to give us some really important cards yeah there's some cool cards on this but it does feel like a not a curated list it doesn't feel like how the uh, multiverse legends in mom where they they had a place in the environment it feels like these are just random cards that some of them are good some of them less good some of them we've seen before some of them are new but they don't really feel like they do anything thematic or particular but I, I, i could be wrong maybe they'll play better than they look inside the environment yeah not quite a bonus sheet but like in the spirit of a bonus sheet just with the less intentionality behind it it seems Final logistic point here, there is a clue tie-in that has a lot of really cool, awesome, cubable cards, but we are not going to talk about any of those cards here because they are not coming to our platform, so we kind of have less interest in them (laughs) than we would otherwise. That being said, we've got absolute boatload of mechanics to talk about from this one set. Chris, do you want to just walk us through Investigate and what that means for the context of Cube? Yeah, so Investigate is a classic mechanic. It's slapped on to Thraven Inspector, which Teld likes to refer to as the most cubable card of all time, which is actually maybe true. Investigate, it's originally from Shadows Over Innistrad. You make a clue token artifact, and you can pay two mana at any time to crack that artifact and draw a card. And honestly, at this point in cube history, cracking clue tokens is starting to feel a little slow. Usually over the course of the game, you know, if you're playing like a grindy resource game or you're playing like a green deck that generates a lot of mana, you can usually afford to crack like one or two. But if you were to generate like six clue tokens, you're probably not cracking all of them in a game. Right, yeah. And you would think it's like really slow but it it clues have or investigate has led to some of the like all-time cube cards you have hard evidence draven inspector tireless tracker and we are actually going to talk about some cards today that generate clues and that's like a lot of the value so it's weird to me because you would think paying two mana to draw an extra card is not exactly what you want to be doing but still some of these cards hold up so just a great mechanic right and that's the only returning mechanic of the set I will say to Chris's point, I think at this point, what I really want to see more of is blood tokens because that paying one instead of two, even though you don't go up a card, is just so, so nice. You can basically always fit it into your curve and it has a lot of synergy. Really want more blood tokens. Hoping we get more soon. I'm sure there will be a set where blood tokens make sense here. We, in fact, uh, a, a month or so ago, Teld was talking about, <laughs> me and Teld were talking, he's like, I bet we get blood tokens back in the, the Ravnica set. And I was like, dude, it's Clue. We're going to get <laughs> we're gonna get clues. It's going to be Clue. Um, you know, blood would have made sense on some cards too, you mm-hmm. know, I think. but yeah. there, there was a lot of murders going on. People were getting stabbed in the back. I was, I was being hopeful. So we have some new mechanics as well, but for these first two, I use the word new 
extremely loosely. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, do you yeah. remember on the Khan's of Tarkir episode when I said Morph wasn't playable or wouldn't be seen in a modern retail set? Or two, yeah. No, <laughs> so you've got Disguise, which is Morph... But the morphs have Ward 2 while they're face down. Like, that is literally the only difference. And, you know, if you've never played with Morph, you can play a creature with Disguise face down as a 2-2 for 3 colorless mana. You can flip it face up for its Disguise cost, and it usually does something when it turns face up. Or it circumvents, like, a downside of, as if you, if you play the card face up, it usually has a downside. But you circumvent that by flipping it face up instead. Morph doesn't play well in cube. Disguise does not play that much better in cube because it's a hidden information mechanic. And when your cube list only has two creatures with disguise, like your opponent knows what it is and can play around it quite well. We talked about that with Stratus Dancer, right? Which has a counter spell mode when it turns face up. If Stratus Dancer is the only morph in your cube and you play with the same people week after week and you play a face down creature, it's like, oh, okay, you have Stratus Dancer. You know, it doesn't play well unless you're going to play like 10 morphs or disguise creatures Mm -hmm. in your cube and you're just not going to do that. They're usually not that good. And then you have the cloak mechanic, which is like mana fest with ward two so when something cloaks a permanent or a card or a creature it puts it face down uh usually from like the top of your library or from your hand or something like that and the only real difference here is that to turn a cloak card face up a it has to be a creature and b you have to pay its mana cost not its mana value but its actual mana cost including like the correct colors and stuff like that Tell you, you've got a note here. It plays a little bit better since, like, cards that cloak are basically just generate in a 2 2 instead of being like this kind of dorky morph creature that's already doing whatever the self contained thing it's doing. Sometimes, uh, you know, cloaking and manifesting is just like kind of like token generation with upside. And, uh, I, I don't know. We, we're going to talk about, I think, exactly one disguise card today, but the disguise on it is kind of incidental. And I don't know that we're talking about anything with Cloak. But yeah, this is just uh, how do we make Morph playable in 2024? Slap Ward 2 on it. <laughs> Which, in, in the limited environment, would normally be pretty good, but I think every removal spell in this set just has can't be countered on it. Yeah, they... Yeah, they Anyway, I'm, I'm going to save that for my final thoughts on the set. We've got a new enchantment type that look like sagas that are not sagas. These are called cases. Basically, cases have a static or ETB ability, and it'll look like chapter one of a saga, so it's going to be really hard not to say chapter. And then the quote-unquote second chapter is a solve condition, something you have to do by the end of your turn in order to quote-unquote solve the case. And then once the case is solved, you'll unlock another ability, which is either a passive or like an activated sack this case to do something. But basically, you're getting a static, you're trying to jump through hoops to do a little bit of a mini game, and then you unlock a final ability on these enchantments. And we've got one really, really good one that we're going to talk about today, but I think that's it. For the most part, the solve condition on a lot of these is kind of gimmicky and weird to the point where like you just don't want to put them in your cube because you have to unlock the last ability to make them good but if the static's already good enough or the etb is good enough that that can be fine worth noting the reminder text is really bad on cases it makes it sound like the cases solve themselves at the end of the turn but they don't if you meet the condition by your end step the case will become solved um so if you meet the condition on an opponent's turn doesn't count you have to do the thing that uh is required to solve the case during your turn and then at the beginning of your end step, they will become solved if you did that. So it's kind of like a little mini game. They're kind of cool, but I think we're only going to be talking about one of them here. So, okay, so if there's like a case that requires you to not have a creature of a certain type, like the Skelly case that we're going to be talking mm-hmm. about, if your opponent forces you to sacrifice it on your turn, does that mean that like the solve, the solve will never happen or on your next end step? I believe you'll meet the condition on your next instep. Okay. It just you can't solve you can't solve it on your opponent's turn. It has to go to your turn's instep to meet the condition to solve. Gotcha. Okay, that's what I thought, but just the way that you phrased it made me question myself a little bit. Well, Chris, do you want to talk about this new suspect mechanic? This is the one that makes me feel like the set's a little bit bloated. But I guess they were like, let's let's make sure we have an aggressive mechanic in our quote-unquote morph set so what's going on with suspect i actually like this one quite a bit more than cloak i feel like they could have cut one of these mechanics there's like a lot going on okay so a suspected creature has menace but can't block 
it's a designation, not an ability or a counter, which which kind of feels like a digital magic era thing. Because in paper, like, you're going to put, like, a counter-looking thing on a suspected creature so everyone knows it's suspected, but it's not yeah. a counter. A creature remains suspected until it leaves the battlefield or something makes it unsuspected. There's there's no synergies that I can think of that are, like, exploitable here. It's literally just a condition on certain creatures. If you play a card that can suspect any creature, you can suspect an opponent's creature on a turn where you're kind of trying to push damage so their best thing can't block. So, like, that that can have implications for aggressive decks. I think most of the time you're going to suspect one of your own creatures to give it menace. That's what I was going to ask. If all things equal, are you supposed to suspect your creature to make it a better attacker or suspect your opponent's creature to take it out of combat? Because suspecting your opponent's creature and making it unable to block as long as it sticks around just makes all of your attackers better, right? But you're also making your opponent's creature better on attacks, so... I guess it depends on the situation. It's going to be contextual for sure. There's some cards, for example, if you put the uh, sus- if you suspect a Corsair of Crucifix, that card loses almost all of its board value, right? It still got obviously can still draw cards or whatever. But the big thing is Corsair is a giant roadblock, and so when it doesn't attack very well, it doesn't really matter if you give it menace; it's there to block. So there's some creatures that giving it suspect will take them out of combat, functionally speaking. Yeah, the the majority of suspect cards can also only target your own stuff in the first place, but the one we're going to talk about today can uh, suspect your opponent's creatures as well. Um, That does bring us to the graveyard mechanic, because this is Cons of Tarkir. We had to have something equivalent to Delve. Collect Evidence usually has a number attached to it, like Collect Evidence 3 or 4, and it means you can exile cards from your graveyard with that total mana value or greater to get some sort of bonus effect. So collect evidence six means you can exile as many cards from your graveyard as you want, but the total mana value of those cards has to be six or greater. A couple notes about this. First off, collect evidence cards conflict with each other a little bit, kind of the same way delve cards do, right? You wouldn't want four copies of treasure crews in your cube deck because you're just not going to be able to cast the third or fourth copy. Same thing with collect evidence. If you're consuming your graveyard for one card, that just means there's less resources for the next one. Second off, lands do not contribute to collect evidence at all. You can exile lands as part of the cost for collect evidence, but since they have a mana value of zero, they don't really add to anything, so there's no real reason to do that, which makes it a little bit different than Delve, right? I know people are comparing this to Delve, but Delve is just like, whatever's in my graveyard, that's my resource. Not so with Collect Evidence. I think Collect Evidence 2, Collect Evidence 4, maybe even Collect Evidence 6, you can expect to get basically at least once every game. But once you get up to those higher numbers, I don't think it's happening. Any thoughts on Collect Evidence? I actually think this is a pretty cool mechanic. I like graveyard-based mechanics, but the cards themselves are really... It's going to be like, what's the effect of the card, right? It's neat, but... But in a way, it's a weird, interesting nod to Delve because it's almost the opposite of Delve where the cards that you play with Delve, you usually play a pile of like fetch lands and one mana spells, right? You just like cycle a bunch of cantrips and you treasure cruise. That -hmm. doesn't really work with collect evidence. You want to be doing like the LTR land cyclers. You want to be doing split cards. So cards like Fire and Ice, which are perfectly cubable on their own, if you want to play collect evidence cards, are a great way to fuel these kind of cards because on those modal cards, those uh, split cards, the total mana value of the card counts towards collect evidence. So for Fire and Ice, each each half is two mana, but the whole collected card is four mana. So you get a bit of an advantage doing that. That being said, I don't really think there's that many that are particularly powerful. I I think it's a fine enough mechanic, but I I think they were very conservative with a lot of the mechanics in the set. And mostly, I mean, I'm grateful for it. There's a couple of power liars in the set, but for the most part, it looks like they were very restrained. They they always do this with graveyard mechanics. I'm happy to see another graveyard mechanic, but I think because there's such a history in magic of graveyard mechanics that they've designed being like wildly abusable. This is not as under supported as undergrowth was, and it's more self contained in a lot of ways than undergrowth was, but it still feels to me like I would have liked to have seen more cards that had smaller effects, but required you to collect less evidence. The The numbers tend to be pretty high. Yeah, they, sure. they're usually one-shot effects, too. Like, collect evidence six or eight, do this thing on your, your spell. Although, you know, we'll talk about one of the white cards here in just a moment that has, like, a small enough number that I think it works out quite well. But 
Yeah, I, I think it's also important to remember they're they're balancing this for retail limited, and this set has morph, so you can morph a you know six mana card, right? And you paid three mana, and then you trade it off, and now mm. you've got stuff for your collect evidence six. So it's possible in this set to have cards that will meet those conditions, so that you could pay the more expensive collect evidence, and it just doesn't translate well to cube, where our cards tend to be extremely efficient. That's a good observation. There's also a lot of cards that get in your graveyard that have high mana values, so like the land cyclers like Lorien Revealed and the Troll basically pay for a collect evidence card themselves. You've got things like Witch Stalker, Frenzy, which is like a four mana card that you actually only pay one mana most of the time. Like sure. There are ways to get around it that um, I don't think requires rework in a cube environment, but we are going to talk about some collect evidence cards. There's a lot of interest in designs here. Uh, personally, my favorite mechanic from the set. I just like graveyard mechanics when they feel like they work, and this one look, feels like it kind of works. It feels like some blue-green copium, given that that's the, uh, the blue-green theme in <laughs> yeah, the set. Yeah, we'll, we'll see how that pans out for Limited as an entire archetype where the cards eat each other's real estate, but we don't have to go into the split cards here. There is a cycle of split cards, but like Teld said, those are kind of here, I think, specifically because of Collect Evidence. The only real wrinkle with the split cards is that they made the entire cost across both cards hybrid mana, where they overlap a color, so technically you can play them in like a monocolor deck, which I think is kind of a cool take on the uh the split cards but does make the set feel just like a tiny bit more bloated than it needs to be there's also some minor things going on there's a single card with wither in the set the massacre girl there's a basic land cycler and an adventure as one-offs and then detectives matter is kind of like a big thing you'll notice um there are a lot of hats like everybody on ravnica just like stopped doing whatever they do occupationally and now they're just all detectives <laughs> there's a lot of murder going on but <laughs> with that being said a lot of mechanics down uh got the flavor down we ready to talk about some magic cards yes let's do it all right well i think it's appropriate that uh you know tell given his love of the thraben inspector kicks us off with uh essentially thraben inspector uh novice inspector what, what do we got going on here yeah, so Novice Inspector is a white mana for a 1-2, and when it enters the battlefield, it investigates. It's a human detective. Like It does have a hat, familiar. though, which feels a little bit of a flavor fail. There's some detectives that don't have hats, and it really bothers me. Thraben Inspector has a hat. Thraben Inspector does have a hat. That being said, I, I mean, what more is there to say? Thraben Inspector is awesome, and having a second one is awesome, because while you may or may not want two in your white deck, you probably do. Uh, there's definitely two white drafters at a lot of tables, and both of them would like a Thraben Inspector. Put it in your cubes. It's awesome. It's hard for Thraben Inspector to be bad. It's good in basically every cube ever made. That's what I wanted to ask you guys, is is another Thraben Inspector exciting? Like, obviously it's yes. good. Thraben yes, Inspector number one's good, but do you guys get excited about just having a functional copy of a card you know is already good? Because I do not. I don't know if I was like a mono-white aggro deck if I would want two copies, because I think Thraben Inspector is the least exciting one-drop for my mono-white aggro deck if I'm playing it, so I don't think I would necessarily want two. Teld might not agree with that. I don't think that I would want to play two, but the reality is that you're going to have two white drafters at a table, and like a blink drafter likes this, a black-white sacrifice drafter likes this, a white aggro player will play one. So I think in a lot of drafts you're going to see both taken and played. And then the other wrinkle to it is if you're playing a list that is bigger than 360 cards increasing the likelihood that a Thraven Inspector is going to be opened in the pool of cards that get opened is probably not a bad thing. So I think that that's a valid question for 360 lists. I think if you're playing like a 540, I think having two of them is, is actually pretty cool. I'm not going to say that I'm a, just excited to have a second copy of any random card in a cube, but I do have a special soft spot for Thraven Inspector. I mean, I, I love playing Popper and Artisan, and the Thraven Inspector and Decor Skyfisher line is just my jam, so... You yeah. know, I, I love I love when we get more cards like this. I, I like these sort of cheap early plays that, you know, they can attack, they can block, you know, they do a little bit of everything, and they also give you a little bit of value on the back end. They're just great. Even if it is a little boring because it's a, sec a second copy, it's a second copy of an awesome card. Okay, so doesn't this point to Thraben Inspector? Because, like, the, the, the Cathars are supposed to be, like, an elite military force, right? Like, doesn't this point to Thraven Inspector not actually being particularly good at his job if a novice <laughs> inspector does it just as well? 
Yeah. Uh, well, the novice inspector is a detective. <laughs> so. They didn't have look. Look, they didn't have a detective agency on on Innistrad, right? He's just doing his best with his little colonial colonial methods. This this guy clearly has he you know he has a whole agency full of hats and magnifying glasses and yeah. You know. No hat here is kind of disappointing, actually. It is worth noting the name Novice Inspector is way more general than Thraben Inspector, so uh, maybe they did this because they intend to put it in more sets, and that's just a name you can throw in any set, as opposed to Thraben Inspector. You know, it's it's kind of funny. We we said we were like not really going to talk about this card. I, I was about to say the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay. Let me tra- let me transition as smoothly as I possibly can. Speaking of cheap creatures with triggered abilities. <laughs> Oh, anybody, wait, anybody, wait, anybody wait, want to take this? What, you, you were just going to drop it there? Okay. No, no, so no, no. no. I, I got it. I got it, actually. I got it. I got it. Okay. So <laughs> the, the next card coming up is Delny Streetwise Lookout, which, despite being a mythic, does not have particularly mythic looking art, but that's okay. No. It is two and a white for a 2 2 legendary creature human scout. So three mana, 2 2, not a particularly good rate. So it better do something good. Creatures you control with power 2 or less can't be blocked by creatures with power 3 or greater. If an ability of a creature you control with power 2 or less triggers, that ability triggers an additional time. So, Tim, you observed here, there's got to be a world where this is busted, and I wholeheartedly agree. It is under rate. So, in the most powerful cubes, I could see this just like being too much of a setup piece to be something you actually want to play but it doubles etbs and attack triggers so it can have an immediate impact and it's power two or less not mv so it counts things like blade splicer angel of invention saradox is great with this right saradox great with this clarion spirit is nuts with this so if you're running like monastery mentor as a spells payoff in white but which let's be honest like if you're running a spells payoff in white you're expecting your drafter to be like is it probably, and splashing white for cards like Clarion Spirit and Monastery Mentor. Notably, this does trigger Young Pyromancer and Third Path Iconoclast twice. Your cheap prowess creatures, it triggers them twice. In Blink, if your Soul Herder is still small, it triggers Soul Herder twice, and then if you're blinking creatures with power two or less, which in our Blink decks at least you generally are, you get double triggers on those. So... I mean, it dies to a stiff breeze, right? This is a three drop that dies to cut down. But this has a lot of cool potential synergies. Like, a lot. It triggers Jadar twice. It triggers Blood Artists twice. Yeah, that that being said, there's also another edge we're we're overlooking when we talk about this card because the second line of text is so exciting. But the first line of text is just going to enable a lot of alpha strikes where you get value on this card the turn you play it. You just like yeah. play it, and now you get to jam with all those creatures that have been gummed up and blocked by that random you know Sentinel of the Nameless City or whatever, yep. and just get in for your opponent. It can lead to a lot of surprise lethals. Um, probably not on turn three, obviously, but you know you, you, when you play this in the mid to late game after you've exhaust you know when you don't have the setup anymore. It could just enable uh, alpha strikes that are really good. That being said, on the other hand, because it dies to a stiff breeze, if you do that and they like disfigure your creature on the stat or like with, during your attack step, blowout city. This is a clean card design to me. I actually, you know, the art is not evocative of a mythic rare, like Chris said, but the text box is very powerful, but the body is not pushed. And I like yeah. that. I like when you get these very powerful effects, but you're compromising by having a little bit of frailty there. And of course, the key here is to get your value right away with like an attack trigger or something like that. So that if yeah. Delany does die, you, you know, you're not dead in the water because your opponent shocked your three drop or whatever so it's how you know it's not an lci rare because uh, that's it was. exactly it'd be, it'd what be i was a three three with ward one or ward two <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah i'm excited to see what people do with it because when we looked at it we looked at like oh what are all the white creatures that work with this but it turns out there's like inti into delny is the most insane thing you can do like everything on inti is a triggered ability so you just get double draws and double counters like there, there's a lot going on with delny it could be that this card doesn't pan out quite well because it is a three mana two two but hopefully optimistic that this card does some really cool things we're not even expecting it just interacts with so much stuff this really feels like the kind of card that uh one of our members doug who is notoriously you know does build arounds will just break and tell us it's all busted for like a month <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Probably. he's, it's he's just it's cracked it, it is super cracked 
Yeah, this card is legitimately has a lot of powerful uh, play play to it, though. So I'm excited to see if it is worth the the buy in or if this card just dies to a shock every time it resolves. Yeah, I, I don't know if this is the case for all cubes, but I suspect that it probably is to some extent. Uh, green decks tend to dunk on aggressive decks if you can't, like, for one mana, remove their first dork because they're just going to play something on three that's like a 3-4 or a 5-5 five, five or something like that. And I like that this could potentially give aggressive decks the effect on board that they need to close out the game. Mm-hmm. So excited about that one. Um, the next one feels like a good bread and butter kind of aggressive creature. This is 10th District Hero, if you're familiar with the character Maliva that they've been following since War of the Spark. This is Maliva, just not technically on a legendary creature. 10th District Hero is one in a white for a 2-3 rare human. It has two activated abilities. The first one is one in a white and collect evidence two. 10th District Hero becomes a human detective with base power and toughness 4-4 and gains vigilance. So that's a pretty good upgrade on a card that starts off as a 2-mana 2-3. Basically, Collect Evidence 2 means exile a, you know, non-land from your graveyard. Like, you should be able to do that with one card. But 2-mana, exile a card or two from your graveyard, becomes a 4-4 with vigilance. Also becomes a detective. It gets the hat. And then for 2 and a white, you can Collect Evidence 4 if it's already a detective, it becomes a legendary creature named Maliva the Stalwart with base power and toughness 5-5 five, five, and gives all of your other creatures indestructible. So that last part, I wouldn't say it's a pipe dream, but it's not really the selling part of the card. It's nice to be able to kind of like figure of destiny this up to like maximum level, but two mana 2-3 two, that can upgrade into a 4-4 four, four with vigilance by basically exiling a card from your graveyard and a little bit of mana. That's just a great place to start that we're considering that second activated ability just gravy and if you get it you get it and it's quite good but yeah nice little package of an aggressive card here and and a nice little way to use your graveyard in white white decks don't have tons of ways to put their graveyard to use so it's not really competing with any other graveyard cards in that color pair yeah honestly not even a bad defensive creature for your slower decks because you can like play this you know you play a removal spell and then you up you upgrade this into a 4-4 vigilance that gets to Smack your opponent a couple of times while holding off their little dorky attackers. I, I like that they they raised the floor a little bit, but lowered the ceiling on how these cards usually work. Usually they start out as like a one one, and then by the end of it, they're some they're like a seven seven flying first striking you know whatever type creature. There's they're some sort of massive flyer. And I, I like that this one is a little more reined in on the ceiling, but made the floor a lot more playable, which is really good for our, for our garment. I think that this is going to play well in the blue-white version of our aggro control decks because evidence can be collected in instant speed. You're going to be countering and cantripping a lot, so I don't think it's going to be a problem to have the evidence in your graveyard that you need. And you can just hold up interaction, and if your opponent taps out for something that's, you know, you don't have to counter or whatever, you just grow this thing, which I think is pretty solid. So yeah, I I expect this card to be good in a variety of places in addition to just being like a fine white creature. Yeah, Uh, two things and we'll move on. Uh, First off, I, I didn't really register that this is an ability you can activate at instant speed which means in your aggro decks, like your kind of creature based white decks, you can do the second activated ability to give all your other creatures indestructible in response to a board wipe. So Maliva would die, but you can keep all your other creatures around, unless it's a damage-based board wipe, but who's playing those, you know? And second thing, like Vigilance, people laugh at Vigilance as like the throwaway ability of magic, but once you put Vigilance on bigger creatures... Like, that becomes a huge threat because you just, you get to play both sides of the the coin with a big creature, you know? And 4-4, like, Vigilance on a 2-2 is kind of like, I'll take it, but whatever. Once you get to, like, 4-4s and 5-5s with Vigilance, that's a pretty big deal. I I honestly think that Vigilance is, like, a huge piece of why Questing Beast is as brutal as it is. Yeah, yeah. Vigilance is good once you get on big creatures. So, altogether, nice package, nice starting um, line, and a, a good use of collect evidence. Like, you could just see it in a world where this was, like, collect evidence six twice or something like that, and it's like, mm-hmm. eh, is that really ever going to happen? But collect evidence two into four is like, yeah, I could see both modes happening, like, in an average game quite often. 
Uh, Teld, I'm going to skip to the, um, I'm going to skip this next enchantment. I'm going to let you take this creature down here just to yep. kind of keep with the creatures here. But uh, there, there's a card that stood out to you. You were talking with Fletcher about how it might be better than Welcome in Vampire. Do you want to talk about this one real quick? Yeah, so this is Wojek Investigator. Uh, so it's two and a white for a angel detective. It's a 2-4 with flying and vigilance. And at the beginning of your upkeep, you investigate once for each opponent who has more cards in hand than you. So for us who are playing in 1v1, that is, it will investigate one time. The reason we were talking about this card is this card is just substantially better on rate. A lot of times Welcoming Vampire is, is kind of fragile. You can't really get it in combat particularly effectively. It, it doesn't necessarily rumble that well in a cube that's increasingly focused on early game cards having good rates. Uh, this card attacks really well. It stays back to block even when it attacks, which makes it super hard to attack into. And then if your opponent is playing a slower deck where you want, you really want the card advantage, you're going to get it. Against more aggressive opponents, you're going to have a 2-4 blocker. So it kind of hits both angles really well where the games where they're more tempo focused, you get a card that's better on rate. And the games that are more attrition focused, you should still be able to, over the course of the game, generate some value on it. Welcoming Vampire is a more reliable draw engine when you're talking about just drawing cards. But I do think you have to consider the fact that, that this card has vigilance and has an extra point of toughness, which is really relevant in a cube with a lot of deal threes. Uh, it's kind of funny because uh, when we were talking about vigilance a second ago, I was thinking to myself, like, flying and vigilance on a high toughness mm -hmm. creature is, like, one of the best combination of keywords in Magic. And this has that. I do prefer Vampire because I think that just drawing a card for free is way, way better than investigating by a lot, especially in your aggressive decks that kind of want to hit their fourth land and then stop hitting lands. There's also a small edge on Vampire, which doesn't come up a whole lot, but it does come up with cards like Ophiomancer or like low-power flash creatures like Malcolm, where you can theoretically trigger Welcoming Vampire twice in a turn cycle. So I, I'm personally on Welcoming Vampire for a variety of reasons, but this card is solid. Yeah, there's a there's a nice little push and pull between those two cards as a comparison directly. Like, do you want to pay extra for your cards in exchange for some extra, you know, combat focus? Do you want your cards for free, but you're slightly worse in combat? You know, the smallest of possible edges, this doesn't die to power word kill. So there's that, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, I think these days in cube, I'm just so much more interested in my cards having good stats than giving me perceived extra value. Good stats are their own form of value in modern cube, especially with the way that we play it. So I consider this a lot better than Welcoming Vampire after talking to Fletcher, uh, or at least a, a noticeable amount better. I could be sold that it's not, but I, I think that fourth point of toughness of Vigilance is really big. Yeah, we might revisit this one. It goes back to what we said um, when Chris was talking about investigate and clues at the beginning where it's like, it feels like not great to have to pay two mana to like draw a clue. But at the same time, like Tyro's Tracker, Thraben Inspector, we just talked about a second Thraben Inspector. These cards are good because they give you clue tokens. So, you know, um, you can't discount something just because the draw is hidden behind a clue. But I'm not sure where I stand on the fence. Uh, we'll, we'll have to maybe try this one out just to see where it stands but i'm leaning a little bit towards welcome in vampire this card just has the stats though and it's hard to ignore that there is one other white card here unfortunately we're not going to talk about like the wrath or the um you know exile target attacking creature because honestly they're just not that exciting they're not going to be replacing anything that people are already playing there is another enchantment in white though called assemble the players this is one in a white for a rare enchantment. You may look at the top card of your library anytime. Wizards, can we please keyword that? Can we just call that peak or something? You put it on every single card now. Once each turn, you may cast a creature spell with power two or less from the top of your library. And, and kind of cute for like the limited constructed environment because you can cast morph creature slash disguise creatures face down off the top of your library. But I mean, your white weenie tech, we talked about Delny, like, literally <laughs> five minutes ago, you know. Delny cares about two power or less creatures, and two power does not mean mana value, too. Like, you kind of conflate the two sometimes. Oh, this is going to let me cast small creatures off the top of my library. No, you can cast your Angel of Invention off the top. You can cast your Saradoc. You can cast your Blade Splicer off the top of your library. You know, there are a lot of really low power creatures that end up giving you more power once they're on board, but they fill the condition. And, you know, I tell... I know you're not high on this card. Part of the problem with it, if you want to call it a problem, is like 
you cast a creature off the top of your library and then there's a land sitting there and it's like white doesn't really have a way to clear that land so you're you're not doing like the turbo like cast a bunch of spells off the top of the library like you would with bolus's citadel or experimental frenzy or something like that but i don't know if you draw like if you cast something off the top of your library even if your next card's a land you functionally draw on a card right you got your card a turn sooner right i guess you did draw a card ultimately but i don't know i, I like these cards to clear at the top of the library I just, that's just where I, I want them to be i want to be able to play lands off the top of my library because as everyone knows i draw about 17 of them every single game they just feel this has the hallmark to be like a constructed card where you can build your entire deck with nothing but two power creatures and find some sort of synergy with it and it's just like literally a draw engine and you can combine it with other things maybe that cleared the top but i'm just not on this super hard i I think this card's like kind of mid i agree with you so you have to cast two creatures off the top for it effectively to be a two mana draw two which is like a solid card but it's not like game breaking and depending on how your deck is shuffled you know what's on top like it could take you a while to even get two cards out of it to me this kind of screams like commander card like i'm imagining this in like an alesha who smiles at death deck which explicitly cares about creatures that only have power two or less the grindier the format or game that you're playing the better this is right because the longer the game goes on the higher the likelihood is that this becomes like a draw three or a draw four But in a cube environment where you're thinking about this for, like, a white aggro deck, generally speaking, you're just going to want to develop, like, a three-power threat on turn two. I was going to say, also, the other problem is that by dedicating a slot to this in your deck, that's a creature or a removal spell you didn't draw in a deck that is trying to win in a very specific amount of time. So I think the deck that's probably best in is black-white, but that deck already grinds infinitely. It just, you you have so many cards that just make random amounts of crap. Like, you don't need this in that deck. Yeah, I'm I'm also just realizing this is once each turn anyway, so you can't you can't just rattle creatures off no. even if they are sitting on top. So you you get maximum one extra creature per turn. You can't just rip. Yeah, this is never gonna play like a cheap experimental frenzy. My my other issue with the card, and this is you know, not for the broader audience necessarily, this is specifically within the context of our cube, but if you design an arena cube with really well supported fast aggro decks and just the quality of the cheap blue interaction that is available on arena you're probably familiar if you play your cube enough with the fact that like control is probably the weakest archetype in a power maxed arena cube. And I don't like that. This is like a card advantage engine that you can put in your aggressive deck that a control deck in, in a lot of cases, unless you're playing white and you have like O rings and stuff effectively can't answer. So regardless of the other concerns that we have, the fact that I think it's maximally effective against controlling decks for the context of our own cube, is problematic to me. Yeah, final death L for me in this card is that you can just put cards in your deck that generate card advantage that add to the board and not put dedicated card draw spells in your deck. Like Welcoming Vampire. <laughs> like Welcoming Vampire or Wojak Investigator. Yep. This is nice with um, Flash Creatures specifically. So sure. just, this might be what Orcish Bowmasters finally needs to be playable in Cube. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we're, we're going to go ahead and move into Blue. This set did not deliver on the blue cards. Now, we're going we're gonna to talk about three blue cards here, one of which is a reprint, but blue creatures? No? no what are blue no creatures? Blue creatures? <laughs> they, they, which is fine, because Ixalan was like a gold mine for blue. I think we got like nine to ten cards from Ixalan for blue. So we can, we can take a step back. The first one here is just a really quick spell to talk about. It's Deduce. One in a blue for an instant. It's a common. Draw a card, investigate. So this is kind of like the new riff on a four mana draw two, which at this point, I think four mana draw two, even if it's split up, no matter what the bonus is, I don't care if you throw scry, surveil, whatever you want on that, four mana draw two is not a good card in modern magic. Uh, That's just where I've landed. Doesn't feel like it anymore. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of still like see them. We still play at least one sometimes two of them in our cubes for like you know traditional purposes like you gotta have the card draw but at this point four mana draw two feels like necessary evil not good and deduce i don't think is changing anything there the exception is if you are in a cube that has a use for that piece of material you're putting on board if that clue matters for like artifact synergies or sacrifice synergies then there's probably something there to it Otherwise, four mana draw two, even if it's split up across different turns, just, 
I'm, I'm not excited about those cards anymore. Yeah, not to go on. A, I'm not going to go on a rant about this, but there are a lot of four drop creatures with good to above average stats in Magic now that immediately generate card advantage, mostly green creatures. And when I think about cards like that and I compare them to something like Memory Deluge, Memory Deluge is four mana to look at four cards and put two of them into your hand, right? A four drop. 4-4, four, four, or these days in Magic, 4-5, that ETBs and draws a card, is effectively Memory Deluge, but one of the cards that you drew was a 4-5 creature that you got to cheat onto the battlefield for free. Does that make any sense? Yeah, it's not, like, obviously direct comparison, but I No, 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 it's, 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 it's not... Well, it's like when Collected Company came out, I think it was Patrick Chapin was talking about the card and said, you know, everybody was talking about how it was going to be, like, a four-mana draw two. And he, he accurately pointed out that at the time, like, Collected Company was not a four-mana draw two. It was a four-mana draw two that also gave you two black lotuses. And, and that's kind of like what you're getting at, right? Is like your, your green card advantage creatures or your card advantage creatures in general, they're drawing you a card because, you you know, the memory dealers goes to the graveyard and you get two cards to replace it. But the card you play that generated value stays on the battlefield. So you essentially got, like, if you view it as a card draw spell, you drew your cards, but one of them was, like, a zero-mana four-four or something. Right. Well, and like to provide like probably the most egregious example of this, look at like Radagast the Brown, uh, <laughs> which for those of you that don't know is four mana for a two five that says when it or another creature enters the battlefield, you look at cards off the top of your library equal to that creature's mana value, and then you can put a creature from among them that does not share a creature type with anything on your board into your hand. And, like, Radagast itself is an avatar wizard in green, right? So it's just not going to share a creature type with, like, anything in your deck. So Radagast comes down, it makes a 2-5 blocker, which is large, and then it impulses the top of your library for basically any creature uh, that you can put it in your hand. So, like, I think that's an even more direct comparison, right? Because it looks like at four cards, just like Memory mm -hmm. Deluge. Except in green, you're always going to want to draw a creature basically, and then the other card that you draw is Radagast, which you then cheat onto the battlefield, if that makes sense. So, anyway, we don't have to spend any more time on this. I, I just wanted to kind of illustrate why I think that 4-mana draw 2s suck in contemporary Magic, and why I think green is actually the best card advantage color in Magic, not blue. Mm -hmm. Well, can I interest you in a 5-mana draw 2 instead? Uh, potentially. Okay, so this is my pick for most powerful card in the set. As yeah. of right now, we'll see, you know, a month from now whether that's right or not. I'm right there with you. Intrude on the Mind. I thought this card was called Interlude on the Mind, but it's actually Intrude on the Mind. Three blue blue for a mythic instant. Reveal the top five cards of your library. Separate them into two piles. An opponent chooses one of the piles. You put that pile in your hand. The rest go to the graveyard. And you make a zero zero colorless thopter artifact with flying and plus one plus one counters for each card that went to your graveyard. Tell, do you want to go ahead and talk about the, the possible splits here and why we're so excited about this card? Yeah, so there's three possible splits on this card. You could do the 3-2 split, which is kind of the, the, the standard FOF split, right? Factor Fiction mm -hmm. split. You've got a 4-1 split and a 5-0 split. Now, I think people who are under, who I think are undervaluing this card are viewing the 3-2 standard Factor Fiction split and being like, well, do I really want, like, is a 2-2 draw 3 or a 3-3 three, three draw 2? Like, is that actually good, given that my opponent gets the choice? And my response to that is, like, it's, it's okay. I, I think the real bread and butter on this one is going to be the 4-1 split. Because mm -hmm. when you look at it this way, what you're getting is a flash flying 4-4 that draws you the best card of your top five. Or you're getting a 1-1 one, one Flash Flyer that draws you four cards. The opponent getting to choose means that there's some counterplay to this or like there's some downsides there. But it's hard for either for me to imagine either of those modes actually being bad at any point. And also, your opponent being able to choose also leaves them having room for mistakes based on contextual game information, right? Like, so, for example, if, they're, if they know you need a Doom Blade to kill a creature, but, like, you just cast this, right? And the Doom Blade is, like, in one of the piles. Like, you know, they might give you four cards to keep you from getting the Doom Blade, and you already had a Doom Blade in your hand, for example. That's just, like, one of them. Additionally, this can come in in combat, and that's a big deal, right? Your opponent may have to just give you four cards so that you don't just get to eat a creature with mm -hmm. your 4-4 four, four flyer. Uh, additionally, there's the other split of 5-0, which 
there's going to be spots where you're ahead enough that your opponent can't let you have a 5-5 flyer and they just have to let you draw five cards. And if you're actually ahead when you cast this, the 4-1 and 5-0 split both just seem like they are just like slamming the door types of card advantage slash threat. I think that the broader cube community is like shitting on this card pretty hard. And I, I will say this. If you are playing a 360 card legacy-esque cube and, you know, your five drop spells are Time Warp and Mystic Confluence, I can definitely see why there's not room for this in your cube, right? But I, given, like, the, the situations that Tell just outlined, I think this card is a lot better than a lot of people think that it is. Because you, you can kind of engineer a scenario where your opponent is damned if they do, damned if they don't. A, a five mana Flash Flyer in certain attacking board states is just going to be something that they kind of like can't let you have. And if they if they decide they can't let you have it, then this is five mana instant speed draw five cards. I'm with Teld. I think the four one split is generally going to be the best one because like I think in most blue decks you would play a card that's either a Flash one one draw four at instant speed or a Flash four four that draws the best card in your top five at instant speed. And your opponent gets to choose which one, and that is a downside. But both of those modes are kind of sick, right? So again, just to reiterate, like, Mystic Confluence, this is absolutely not. So, I, like, for, for the highest power level cubes, this is probably not worth considering. But for our power of cube, and for, like, modern cube, and things of that nature, I think that this card is actually a pretty good deal for 5 mana, even though your opponent has some agency, because you can orchestrate situations where the agency that they have kind of matters less because either thing that they give you is a good deal. I think people who are poo-poo in this card are getting a little bit too caught up on the comparison to Factor Fiction itself and cards like that. First off, Factor Fiction still kind of holds up. It's like behind the times a little bit, but it still kind of holds up as a card draw spell. But then we've seen versions where your opponent gets to choose the pile you end up getting, like, I don't know, Steam Augury and Fortune's Favor. And those cards are terrible because you're just picking you're like it's just a raw card advantage draw spell and your opponent is going to ensure that you never get the best card from those piles so people are honing too closely on the fact that your opponent gets to choose the cards that you get and you'll notice we didn't spend very much time just now talking about like where the best card should go in the split because this is just raw card draw you are likely not going to get the best card out of the five from this card but the fact that you're making a body separates what this card does from every other factor fiction variant out there so you can't really compare it directly to like drown yard at the epiphany or something because those cards don't put a creature on board you Mm -hmm. know i forget who it was on twitter but i was like i think you're discounting the fact that this makes a creature and they responded saying well i wish it was an actual creature spell so i could blink it and i was like yes i wish magic cards were better than they were like i get it (laughs) flip side you can snapcast your torrential gear hulk this which is also sick yeah, the fact that it's a spell too instead of a creature also has upsides, but you you can't you can't compare this to factor fiction directly or a bad factor fiction version directly because none of those spells have made creatures in the fact in the past and it is true you will not get the best spell out of the five or whatever that's fine you still three mana draw two like compare this the, the direct comparison that I think makes more sense is shark typhoon on five mana right shark typhoon on five mana makes a three three flash flyer that draws you a card and if you do the three two split you're getting a better version of that you're either getting a two two flyer that draws three which i think that card's insane five mana flash two two flyer draw three i think that card would be incredible (laughs) um or you're getting a shark typhoon token that draws you two cards instead of one and obviously shark typhoon scales the more mana you have so it's not a direct comparison but yeah this is just going to refill your hand if you're behind like yes there are situations where you're behind your opponent is attacking you for like 10 and you just need a flash blocker and they're going to give you like the worst possible body that you can get to just run you over and not care about the card so you can't do like the 5-0 split in that scenario but if you're at parity or you're ahead like the 4-1 5-0 splits just going to slam the door on the game like your opponent just can't give you five cards and if they can't give you five cards like a 5-5 flash flyer for five is going to kill them in a couple turns so i think this is exactly what i need card draw to look like is affecting the board 
meaningfully and draw in enough cards off of you know the amount of mana you're spending to to make it worth casting a quote-unquote pure card draw spell which this is not yeah it really can't be understated how like even the one one right the fact that you can play that in combat gain a little life and then that life gives you often enough time to play the cards because you aren't as under as much pressure because you were able to reduce the, the life loss, right? So now you get to untap, you've got six mana, and now you can start playing your big powerful spells or all the cards you have in your hand. That little bit of life gain really helps on these sort of card draw spells, even in the spot where like it's a 1-1 one, one and it's just jump blocking. Yeah, if making a 1-1 one, one blocking a three power creature and then digging four cards deeper towards the wrath that you're looking for, I think is a pretty good mode. My my final verdict on this card is if you're playing cube at the absolute peaks of power level with every amazing blue card that's ever been printed, I don't see how this makes your 360. But if you're playing a card pool restricted or lower than the peaks of power but still powerful cube, like an arena cube or a modern cube or whatever, I think that this is definitely worth a look. Yeah. Um, so that, that's probably enough said on this card. Very excited for it. I think it's going to perform extremely well in our card pool and give us that card like we just went from like four you know four mana draw two sucks to like here's a card draw spell i'm excited about so <laughs> well, it makes a body it makes a body and that that is super relevant in modern magic that that's what we said about Sar- saruman's trickery right is like the counter spells and the draw spells don't affect the board so they just drop off in a uh you know a magic design philosophy world where everything affects the board and gives you card advantage so like blue getting in on that is what we need to make the blue control decks viable I guess we're wrapping up blue already. We just started blue, but <laughs> there there is spell snare. Well, we're going to see how it does for us. Uh, single blue, instant counter target spell with exactly converted mana cost two. Which sounds like a pretty severe restriction, but that catches most Doom Blades, most of the red removal spells. It catches most of the aggressively slanted creatures. Just catches enough that you're going to be able to trade up on tempo. There's not a lot to be said here. It's a good, solid card. It's going to have windows where it's bad, but also blue is the color with the best looting. So if it's in a spot where your opponent just never played a two drop because they're on a green deck, then, you know, you could just rummage this away in a lot of cases. Yeah, I mean, like, the same can be said for, like, Spell Pierce or Stern Scolding, and we've seen how powerful those cards are. I think it's going to serve, like, two really important functions for me, anyway, like the decks I like to draft. First of all, if you're on the draw in a control deck, you know how punishing it is to have your opponent play one drop, you play a land, they play a Snowball, a two drop, like Luminarch Aspirant, and there's not shit you can do about it. And then you have to untap and like Doomblade a thing, but then they're going to play a three drop. That's really brutal, right? So if you have this in your opening hand and you're on the draw as a control player, this gives you the opportunity to say no to that two drop that's going to be hugely problematic on one and then play your second land and hold up a two mana counter spell that will catch your three drop. Like that line is going to take games against aggressive decks that you could probably never win unless you exactly draw into a wrath and and suddenly put you back in the game i think that that's huge for control decks in in our environment and as you mentioned it catches most doom blades get lost lightning strike all that stuff so specifically in aggro control decks which want one mana counter spells because you want to be able to develop threats and still be able to interact on the stack you're going to be able to develop a threat and then be safe against that threat being answered by two mana removal spells for yep. one mana, which is like more or less what Spell Pierce does for those decks. So I, I in those two specific cases are the cases that I'm most excited about. And the lower curving your cube is, the more likely that this card will still be useful at a later date. Yeah, this is one of those cards that I wish we got more of in Magic, which are cards that are explicitly designed to be better when you're on the draw. Spellsnare is at its best when you are on the draw because you get to play, use your turn one play to counter your opponent's turn two play and break into kind of parity when you have access to your better set of removal instead of just following, falling further and further behind. Yep. Give us four spike, please. That's what I want next. I love a mana tithe. You all ready for, uh, you ready to hold this up on turn two and your opponent goes one drop, one drop? <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, ha they like, they just play around spell snare perfectly. You, you will, you will feel like a dummy holding this card occasionally, depending on what your opponent plays, but I think it's going to be good more often than not. But that's where that Luden comes in, right? That yep. Luden helps a lot there. Oh, spell snare is dead. It's turn five. Let me cycle that away plus not to mention like the reason we're talking about this card like for more than 30 seconds is our blue counter spell suite 
in the arena card pool is still kind of like real janky. bad. Real, <laughs> yeah. real like we bad. go we go memory lapse counter spell and then it's like a drop off to like your essence scatters and your quench variants and stuff like that. So spell snare actually is stronger than a lot of what we already have to play with. Also, we had three blue cards to talk about and one of them was bad. So yeah, we we're just really trying to stretch uh, <laughs> the, the our Watsi uh, FBI agent said that we have to talk about blue for at least a X amount of time. So. <laughs> well, black black's not going to fare much better. We have three cards to talk about in black, and one of them is Long Goodbye, which is <laughs> one in a black for an instant uncommon, can't be countered, and destroy target creature or Pineswalker with mana value three or less. I, honestly, I could have just deleted this from the file and not talked about it, but I do think there are some environments where Eliminate which is one in a block. It's the same card without the uncounterable text. I do think there are some environments with enough three mana planeswalkers or like Ren and Six types cards floating around that eliminate might be something you want over like the fourth or fifth Doom Blade. And if that's the case, Long Goodbye is just an upgrade to eliminate. I also like that the um, spells can't be countered is kind of teaching people how these sorts of spells work with ward though it's questionable there's like four spells that can't be countered in the limited set which makes it you know how they used to do like a uh, cre- berry target creature or whatever and like they used to put can't be regenerated on like everything and it was like what was the point of regeneration if every single like burn spell said the creature can't be regenerated this <laughs> this is what it feels like is like we're gonna put ward on everything but now we're gonna make a bunch of removal spells that can't be countered yeah, so it's the arms like, race um i will say there's one other end is that most formats of all power levels have some sort of delver archetype uh broadly speaking just a deck yeah, yeah. a deck that's just looking to leverage cheap plays plus uh counter magic and this does let you get around those though of course being a modern horizons 2 design of course this doesn't hit merc tide regent which is the one you really want to hit anyways <laughs> I'm assuming for those environments, like Sudden Edict is better, but I, I'm, my guess is any cube that has a uh, Narset, Parter, or Veils, uh, the three mana Narset, as like an extremely important card in the cube, that Long Goodbye is probably something that's worth looking at. But that's enough for, uh, we don't play Eliminate, so we're not interested in, you know, the Eliminate that hoses counter spells when our counter spells aren't good. So right. <laughs> you can't spell Snare Long Goodbye. Um, Chris, we've got a new board wipe to talk about here. Oh, I wanted to talk about the next one, but I'll take this. Um, take them both. Take them both, man. So this card is called Deadly Cover-Up. It is three black black for a sorcery. As an additional cost to cast a spell, you may collect evidence six. Destroy all creatures. If evidence was collected, exile a card from an opponent's graveyard. Then search its owner's graveyard, hand, and library for any number of cards with that same name and exile them. That player shuffles, then draws a card for each card exiled from their hand this way. First things first, if you have Toxic, if you have Damnation, if you have like the, the really excellent Black Wraths, this is not for you. You just don't need it. The reason that we are talking about it is we unfortunately have been relegated in the arena card pool to playing Crux of Faith. <laughs> Which, there are situations that you can engineer that you, like, wrath the board but keep your dragon. That almost never comes up. I think it's a lot more common, frankly, if you're playing, like, a blue-black control deck. Your opponent, to, has, your opponent, your opponent has a glory bringer that you can't clean up. Which, yeah, is not where you want to be. Also, and I've seen this happen more than once, because you have to, like, click a button on Arena to say dragon or non-dragon. I've literally, I, I felt... It felt like a shitty way to win, but I literally won a match once because my opponent clicked too hastily and clicked destroy all dragon creatures, which destroyed nothing on board. So, Crux of Fate, get the fuck out of my cube. The other thing is, black control decks in our environment actually have a tough time dealing with recursive creatures. White is a lot better at it because it has a lot more effects that actually exile creatures. So, being able to wrap the board and then, like, get your tenacious like your opponent's tenacious underdog out of their graveyard i think is pretty big game notably if it doesn't say non-land from your opponent's graveyard so if your opponent has like surveilled a mountain into their graveyard with darcy and you wrap the board with this you can exile all the mountains out of their deck now how brutal that will be at that point in the game remains to be seen in in some cases if their mana base is already well developed that could be an upside because they just don't have any dead land draws anymore but I could foresee a situation where this like hoses somebody pretty badly. So I do wish that it said non-land, but it doesn't. We're, we're mostly playing this because it's three black black destroy all creatures unconditionally. 
Yeah, there's also the slight edge case with this where you can collect evidence and exile a card. Maybe you care about it recurring, maybe you don't, but then get to peek at your opponent's hand. So that way you know how uh, how bad the next turn's going to go for you. But um, no, no, having, having, that inf- having that information could be valuable, right? You get to know what's in your opponent's deck. So if you're really, if you're really spiking, you can kind of look and see what they have access to, you know, and getting to see their hand could have relevance. Coming down a little too late for that to be relevant in a lot of games, but it is an edge case that will come up from time to time, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and it's not free upside either. You do have to collect evidence six to get that surgical extraction ability. I bet this is like relevant for probably exactly standard because you like take the she- you kill the shieldred, you get rid of all the shieldreds or something like the, that. The Rafine or the, the Atraxa or something, yeah. Yeah, the the bonus text here will come up when you're playing against a, a deck that you know has like recursion or has like a flashback card or something like that in their graveyard that you want to get. Otherwise, like you probably just don't even collect the evidence. You know, you just five mana wrath the board. Chris, do you have your uh, Sherlock Holmes hat on? Because it sounds like you're on the case. Uh, <laughs> this next card is called Case of did the you Stash. Tell, did you hear Chris's disappointment when I was like, can you talk about the Black Wrath? He was like, oh man, they're oh, going to talk, talk about, about the, the stack the case. card, guys. Uh, yeah, seriously. So, <laughs> Go ahead. This next one is called Case of the Stashed Skeleton, and I think it might be the only case that we discuss in this episode. It's one in a black. It's ETB is create a 2-1 black skeleton creature and then suspect it. So two mana for a 2-1 menace can't block isn't a great deal, but if you're playing an aggressively oriented black deck, like you could do worse than a 2-1 menace creature. In general, not good enough on its own, right? Like I don't even, we don't play Glint Sleeve Siphoner. To solve the case, you control no suspected skeletons, which is a runaround way of saying if this thing isn't on the battlefield anymore, you solve the case. And when you solve the case, you can pay one in a black and sacrifice this case and search your library for a card, any card, put it into your hand, then shuffle, activate only as a sorcery. So what this boils down to is this is a 2-1 menace can't block that dies and draws demonic tutor. More or less, right? You can't just, like, sacrifice it, immediately solve the case. Like, if this dies on your turn, you're not detutoring until next turn. But I, I'm going to go on record and say, like, I, this is probably not there for the highest power level cubes, especially if you are already playing Demonic Tutor in your cube. We have Demonic Tutor banned for a variety of obvious reasons in, in our environment. But I'm just going to come out and say that I think a 2-1... Menace for two that dies and draws D tutor is actually a pretty good two drop. Yeah, I'm, I might be going out on a limb here, but I actually think in the context of our cube explicitly, this might be better than Demonic Tutor. And I'm saying that only because this is a card you can play on turn two. You get some damage in to get your opponent's life total ticking down. Then eventually you sack or the skeleton dies or whatever. And then on the next turn, you go get your your Blood Artist, Meat Hook, whatever, and you kill your opponent. This is a Demonic Tutor in that sense that chipped in damage. I'm not going to like make the claim that it is more powerful, and it probably isn't even in the context of our cube, but this card could have like a better... It could be better for the decks that were like really abusing Demonic Tutor, because that is what got Demonic Tutor banned, is the Black Sack decks being able to put yeah. together these these combos and like that's how that deck works right so this just is like you play this on two proactively which demonic tutor could never do it was just a dead draw until you're ready to combo and then like now you're chipping in damage and your opponent doesn't ever want to block this because they don't want to give you demonic tutor right i think demonic tutor is a card that gets stronger and stronger the more powerful individual cards are in your environment or the more hard combo like two card combos that win the game are present in your cube right so i don't think that demonic tutor is as egregious in most fair environments as it is in something like vintage cube where you're going to go get like your you know splinter twin if you already have a, a twin piece on the border like something like that for example right as Teld mentioned, the Sacrifice deck is actually the deck that got Demonic Tutor banned eventually because it is the closest thing to a combo deck that exists in the cube, right? You're trying to put together your Artist, your Yawgmoth, some junk on the battlefield, so you just go get whatever you need, right? But the reason that I'm mentioning that is given that this is ideal in that deck and that deck is where Demonic Tutor was the most abusable I can see the potential for this card in our environment specifically to end up being a little too strong. 
we're just going to have to see. And I think even in relatively higher power level cube environments, like if you're playing a 540 card cube and you have any kind of aggressively oriented uh, or sacrifice oriented black deck in your cube, I actually think this is a pretty good two drop. So maybe something to look at. Well, let me tell you why this card actually sucks, though. If your opponent suspects one of your other skeletons, <laughs> then you can't solve it. So, <laughs> well, okay. So, in all seriousness, when when you do, when you say two, you know, two mana, two one menace dies and draws demonic tutor. That's obviously an insane card. There's there's a little bit more nuance to it that makes me feel like it'll it'll be okay. Mm-hmm. even if it's very strong, and that's A, the skeleton can't block, so you can't just be like, haha, I brick-walled your entire you know, uh, army of attackers because I'm just going to block with this and draw Demonic Tutor and go get my Wrath. Like, There's a little bit of push and pull there. Also, if your opponent does trade with your skeleton, like you attack them, they do block, the skeleton dies, you're not solving the case until your next end step, and then you can't even activate until the following turn because it's sorcery speed only for the sacrifice right. effect. Right. So like, there's a whole two-turn gap between when it dies on your opponent's turn and when you can actually crack the case so to speak Th- this card should just be very very powerful i think like it's a, it's a good aggressive two drop that dies and you know will eventually tutor a card from your library for two extra mana that's very strong so that being said that that's all we have for black like no creature i guess you could count this case as a creature but just a couple spells and a creature one spell we're not even that excited about red has a, a decent amount more to talk about here Starting off with, uh, I'm going to throw this one to Teld because I think Teld, fr- from our conversation about whether, you know, what to include this over and stuff like that, it sounded like Teld was maybe just a tiny bit higher on the card than Chris and I. But uh, go ahead and take Fugitive Codebreaker. Okay, so Fugitive Codebreaker is one in a red for a 2 1 prowess haste with disguise for five in a red, costs one less for each instant and sorcery in your graveyard. And when it's turned face up, discard your hand, draw three cards. So it was actually the community that was more excited about this card. Uh, I, I think it's fine. It's a two power aggressive creature with prowess, which is always nice. It's got haste. So it's, it's jamming the turn you play it. And then if you draw it in the late game, you know, it's four or five mana for uh, like draw three cards, which is, is fine as a, a way to, you know, draw some extra gas. Um, I actually, I think my exact words were they, they, everybody was talking about this being better than Abbott. And I just saw bad for a uh, hearth elemental. I think was my exact words <laughs> <laughs> or hearth elemental with extra steps or something. I think people saw two mana, two, one prowess. And they're like, Oh, th- it's like Abbott of Carol keep, but this one has haste. So it's better than Abbott of Carol keep. And it's yeah. like that, that comparison doesn't really add up to me. Like, Okay, Abbot of Carol keeps just always going to draw you that card like in the middle light game. This one, you you can never disguise this on turn three. The only time disguise ever matters is if you top deck this with enough mana to like disguise it and flip it up and you don't want to discard your hand, right? Which I, so, I think is going to come up in your aggressive decks uh, somewhat frequently. I, I do think that is not an unrealistic game plan, to be clear. I personally do. I, I feel like the disguise is just never going to happen on this card. And I'll, I'll bite my words. Like, you can you can sound clip this and then play it back for me when it happens. Like, I don't think that's ever going to happen. I think you're going to you're gonna play it on turn two. So, like, you're, you're talking about only top deck situations where you're actually going to disguise it. Like, even if you have another two drop, you don't play this on turn three and pass the turn. Like, you cannot play a face down disguise creature in cube. Absolutely, sure. You would still just play it face up, you know? I think my thoughts were, and this is why I didn't really like the Abbott comparison, is I think this card is better on exactly turn two. And I think this card is probably better on like turn six plus, like late into the game. And I think Abbott is better on turns three through five, three through six, whatever the, there's a break point in there somewhere where this becomes a better top deck, right? Because you're just drawing Mm -hmm. three cards for like four or five mana. But people, I, I think are undervaluing how good Abbott is at like it's turn three and I missed my third land drop and now I get a second shot at it and put a two one into play. I, I mean, I think credit for him, we, we cut Abbott for this, I think, but I didn't really like that comparison as a, as a baseline. I think it was kind of a, a weird comparison, even though they kind of sort of do different issues. I think this is just another one of those, by the way, another one of those like just better Bedlam revelers. They they printed hearth elemental, which I, I personally like a little better. But I still think this is another one of those better limb reveler, but like you can play it earlier into the game or it does something that's that's meaningful. I mean, ignore all the disguise text. How how good is two mana two one prowess haste? It's fine. 
Like, if that's where the text ended, that card would be pretty decent for any spell slingery kind of aggressive deck, right? I mean, I think it's really good if you're, like, if you're on the play, right? You go one drop, and then they go, you know, one drop mana accelerant or something, and then you play this, and you kind of force them to decide, am I going to trade for this 2-1 with prowess now before it can get bigger and, like, slow down my acceleration? If they don't then you chipped in two damage, and then it obviously has the potential to be like a prowessy threat later. As you guys have already said, it is not clear to me that this is on average better than Abbot of Carol Keep. The reason that we chose Abbot as the cut was there's a concern that if you have too many prowess creatures in red, then the cheap red cards don't play with anything else but more red cards or cheap blue cards, right? So that kind of seemed like the obvious thing to do. I mean, who who knows? Like, I think the disguise mode is going to be useful the most often in is it decks specifically. I don't know how much is going to come up in mono red. We'll just have to see. Like, I, I think this card has the potential to impress. I think it's a decent little two drop. I think if you have all of the two drops in Magic's history available for you in red, this is probably not a world beater. But the potential is there for this to be very good, I think. Maybe I'm an insane person, but my suggestion to cut was actually Young Pyromancer because I think that card is is quite bad in our current environment. I understand oh, that that is a not, that is not on this episode. Tell the... not now. No, we no. can't do that right now. We Controversy. Don't, don't have to... <laughs> I I don't disagree with that statement. Yeah, just to clarify, uh, I don't think the disguise text is downside <laughs> for the the one person who's out there like, oh, well, disguise is all upside. Yes, I understand that. <laughs> like, I get it. Next up, Frantic Scapegoat. All right, so this is a really dorky-looking card that I actually think could end up being pretty good. Again, I I feel like I'm saying this about every card in this set because it's a relatively low-power set. If you have access to, like, every red one-drop ever printed, you you can just skip forward a minute. Like, (laughs) this is not for you if you have, like, Goblin Guide and Zergo Bell Striker and Raghavan and shit like that in your cube. But Frantic Scapegoat is one red mana for a 1-1 with haste. When it enters the battlefield, suspect it. And whenever one or more other creatures enter the battlefield under your control, if Frantic Scapegoat is suspected, you may suspect one of the other creatures. So most often, one creature is going to be entering the battlefield, but this line of text is on here, so you can't give, like, two tokens that you you made at the same time a menace. If you do suspect one of those other creatures, Scapegoat is no longer suspected. So breaking it all down, this is a 1-1 menace haste, can't block. And at some point later in the game, you can make another creature that comes down menace can't block. So on turn one, I actually think that a 1-1 menaced haste is probably going to chip in more damage over the course of a game than just a Savannah Lions in red. We've seen with Stalactite Stalker, it's a a 1-1 menace, but especially as you develop other creatures after this, like, and you're pushing damage, like, how how badly does your opponent want to double block your 1-1 and let your bigger creatures get in through for damage? Like, that in and of itself pushes damage, right? Beyond the damage that the card itself will do, forcing your opponent to double block a 1-1 when you have two power and three power creatures on board, that is an indirect way of pushing damage. And not only that, but once this body is, like, no longer relevant, maybe the board's, like, littered with tokens or something like that, there are a lot of haste and first strike creatures in red. And menace first strike is a disgusting combination of keywords, and haste menace, if you are ahead and you're pushing damage, is also a disgusting combination of keywords. So once this no longer becomes relevant... It makes one of your other threats even more relevant after having chipped in some damage. There's there's quite a number of cards that we aren't running anymore that if you're playing are actually kind of broken with this card. So like cards like Hellrider or Hazaret, if you give those Menace, just I mean it's it just becomes even more disgusting than it already was. This card passing off Menace onto a creature, even if it can't block, if you're if you're playing to be the beatdown, giving this like an empty right? It, it becomes so obnoxious to deal with some of these extremely powerful creatures by combat, on top of the fact that red is really good at dealing with these sort of cheap blockers people tend to like to leave behind when they're trying to race a red deck, right? You're like 1-1 one, one tokens or 2-2s two or whatever, because that, that's what burn is really good against. Now, this is a little bit of a weird example, because if you're on Lelia, you're probably not on this card. You have like Raghavan and stuff in your cube, but it is notable that if you have a big cube and you're looking for another red one drop... Giving Lelia Menace is really, really, really nasty. 
Because the only time that Lelia is not a good card is when you go to play it on three, but your opponent has already engineered a board state where you can't really attack with Lelia. Giving Lelia Menace is really big game. Giving something like Breaches is big game. I think giving something like Goblin Rabble Master Menace is actually pretty big game as well. And as you mentioned, it, it's really, really gross with Hellrider because it makes Hellrider significantly harder to block and it also contributes damage to Hellrider's triggers. One other edge on this card that I like is ever since we got Goblin Bombardment and Red Cap Gutter Dweller, we've been kind of looking for more ways to support red as a secondary color to Black Sacrifice, because traditionally in our cube it's either been Black White or Mono Black. And giving one of your aggressively oriented Sacrifice creatures or, or Black Aggro creatures like Gix Menace is really good, and then when this body's no longer relevant, you can just feed it to Yawgmoth or Woestrider or something. So, I guess, in, in summary, for me, like, I've said it a bunch of times this episode, and I'll say it more, peaks of power level cubes, this card is probably too dorky for you, but at our power level, I actually think that this has enough interesting edges that I expect it to be better than Red Savannah Alliance. Just as a, as a final edge case, this also has one of the best arts to ever grace, grace a magic card. This is a, uh, just, just take a look at it. It's, it's pretty good. Yeah. If you, if you started when, when Chris was like, oh, you can skip ahead a minute to skip over the conversation about frantic scapegoat. If you did that, it turns out uh, he was still just talking about frantic scapegoat. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Dude, you gotta, gotta escape for a couple more minutes. <laughs> yeah. This card's going to be better than, it, this card's going to be better than it looks, I think. Yeah. It does, it does look like, like the stat line's kind of like, eh, I, I, it'll it'll probably play out quite well. That brings us to dead, uh, not dead answers, demand answers. Uh, this is another quick one to talk about. This is just kind of power creeping a spell. If you listen to all of our episodes, if you're one of those, you know, two people. Hi, Drix and Roja. How are you doing? <laughs> hey, hey, Drix. You might remember the um, Kanza Tarkir episode where Chris said something to the effect of, oh, Kanza Tarkir is so old that there are cards that power crept the cards that power crept cards from Tanza, Kanza Tarkir. And Demand Answers is exactly that, right? Khan's had Tormenting Voice for the first time, and now we're used to Thrill of Possibility and all those variants. And Demand answers is now a power crept version of thrill of possibility but to read the card real quick one in a red instant it's a common as an additional cost to cast the spell sacrifice an artifact or discard a card draw two cards so thrill of possibility but you can now sacrifice an artifact to it um which is fine you know it, it's nice to have a red draw spell that's not just like the impulse two and stuff like that it's an instant it has more things you can do to get your cards i was thinking last night though in the context of like our cube and stuff it, it's not really that beneficial to sacrifice a clue or a blood to cast this spell right because you're just getting rid of a, a resource that's eventually going to be worth a card anyway to just like expedite the cards you're drawing so this, this isn't like super exciting revolutionary card or anything like that but it's one of those ones i wanted to mention like long goodbye where they're just like ever so slightly pushing a traditional effect and it's like at what point do you push the effect enough that it's playable in like our cube environment and I, i'm not a thrill of possibility believer I, I just don't think it's like the spells matters kind of card that you want but giving you an additional way to cast it is nice and probably means that demand answer sees play in some sort of cube like this is almost assuredly going into my affinity cube the one question i wanted to ask you guys is how does this card stack up to like reckless impulse or ren's resolve the two mana exile two you can play until the end of your next turn i mean those cards are card advantage your deck has to have a very low curve for it to consistently be card advantage but i i think that those cards in a, a generic environment without artifacts that you to cheap artifacts that you want to sack uh, i think that those cards are probably better yeah, this card gets a lot better in environments that are supporting, you know, artifact sack, artifact trinket tokens randomly, stuff like maps that you don't mind sacking or things you want to actually Treasures, crack. Yeah. Treasures, yeah. Uh, additionally, if you play like the, the madness cards or anything like that, some lower power cubes might do that. This is like a good um, kind of bridge point between a couple of different archetypes that are sometimes supported in weaker environments. All right, so let's move on from there. Just a nice little upgrade to an effect that we see quite often. We've got a removal spell here called Torch the Witness. Red X for a sorcery. It's an uncommon. Torch the Witness deals twice X damage to target creature. If excess damage was dealt to that creature this way, 
investigate. You can pay two mana to deal two damage. You can pay three mana to deal four damage, and from there it scales up. And if you ever deal excess damage with this spell specifically, you get a clue token. Yeah, th- this seems like a nice little removal spell. It can't go face. It's a sorcery, so it's got kind of a little bit of limitations on it, but it should kill anything you target at, even if you maybe have to be a little bit inefficient. It is nice, though, to have a red spell that can occasionally kill, like, a uh, 6-6 six, six or 7-7 seven, seven if you really need it to, though. Yeah, this kills pretty much anything if you're willing to spend the mana and probably gains you some card advantage, which is is nice. There's been um, some Jeskai decks that I've played over the course of our cubes environment that probably would have actually liked this as just a, a way of, you know, one for wanting a creature that also generates a bit of card advantage and then I can like leave up two mana for counterspell or something like that on like turn five. There's definitely some play here. It's nice that we've gotten an, another card that can help deal with the number of X4s that are floating around these days because it seems like every set now just has a couple of those that are just bigger and bigger stat lines coming down earlier and earlier into the game. I think that this effect is really interesting in red, like a removal spell that can generate card advantage, albeit like slightly expensive card advantage. One thing that I want to note is... Usually fireball style effects absolutely suck at killing creatures on rate. They're just awful. Like spending five mana to kill a four toughness creature in your red deck is like a really terrible way to spend your mana. And the the upside is that you can go face, but like spending five to deal four upstairs is also a really bad deal. This scales quite well. Turns out that in your red deck, like, six toughness green blockers are nearly impossible to deal with without attacking a three power creature into it and then bolting it, in which case you've two for one yourself. And I also think that in, like, more controlling red decks, like Grixis decks, being able to spend two mana to kill a one toughness creature and then leave a clue behind on board for yourself to crack later and replace the card is actually a pretty good deal. So... Not for the highest power level cubes, you're probably just going to play more cheap, efficient face burn if you have access to it. But this is an interesting card, and and the more cards that we have that allow red to punch through high toughness creatures for one card, the better, in my estimation. I I like this print. I think it's interesting. Mm -hmm. Tell, you had a suggestion for a card here that you wanted to talk about that um, is not a traditional effect for our cube in particular. Why don't you go ahead and take this one? Yeah, so I saw this card early into spoilers and was kind of enamored by it. Um, So it's Convenient Target. It is a single red mana for an aura, and it enchants creature. When it enters the battlefield, it suspects the enchanted creature, which I'm just now noticing, actually, that's a keyword designation. So the Convenient Target does not provide the suspect. So somehow you bounced it or got it back into your hand somehow, you could have that creature the creature inter- remains like, suspected yes. yeah exactly so it gets plus one plus one and for two and a red you can return convenient target from your graveyard to your hand so it's a really interesting design there's a lot of synergies here especially for weaker environments so if you do things like heroic if you do things like auras matter if you do things like madness again where because this is like a card you can eventually buy back you don't mind discarding it in slower lower power environments i can definitely see a lot of synergy for this now for our sake the biggest thing is that red often your opponent is stabilizing like a single big creature to brick your board and you just need to get a little bit of chunk of damage to get them in burn range and this can do that relatively cheaply so you can play this like you can play another creature play this on a creature you already have that can attack to give it menace early into the game allowing you to attack into your opponent and then later into the game after that creature has died you could potentially buy this back clear an opponent's blocker it creates a lot of awkward board states for your opponent where they they have to leave back more blockers maybe than they intended giving you more time to buy get into your burn spells it triggers prowess dudes really cheaply So I don't know if this card's actually good. It's really hard to say without having played this whether it's going to be worth the squeeze on it. But one mana to push a bunch of damage because it also makes your creature bigger. You know, it's just got a lot of gameplay to it. I I could see this being a total flop or I could see this being just a really, really good early aggressive tool that allows our red decks to just get past those early game blockers. Yeah, for me, like boilerplate disclaimer, high powered cubes, probably no room for this. For our specifically, the more I think about this card, the more I think it's going to be just awesome. It's a single mana, as you mentioned, it triggers your prowess dudes. Menace N plus one plus one is really, really nice on creatures that either have first strike or have to attack to get a trigger. So I think it's really common in, in, in this, I think this is just generally true of red decks in, in Magic. 
where you get your opponent down to like four life and they've stabilized and you maybe have like two turns to figure out how you're going to kill them before they either gain some life or play some huge effect that closes out the game or whatever, right? I I'm sure all of us who have played Red have ended up in the situation where our opponent is not quite dead and now we're praying for something off the top of our deck to get us over the finish line before they like figure it out. I, I have lost many a game as a red aggro deck with my opponent on four life. So what I'm getting at is if you play this early, I mean, you can get two for one technically, but it's cheap, right? So if, if the creature gets removed later, it's not like a huge tempo blowout, like putting a three mana aura on a creature. And it's, it's just really not uncommon later in the game as a red deck to not have anything to do and plenty of mana to do stuff with. And the fact that you can just buy this back and slap it onto a creature again, I think it's going to get you over the finish line in a lot of different situations. And that was before I even considered the fact that... So on some boards, it's going to be right to recur this and put this on a specific attacker to produce the best possible combat math that wins the game. And in other situations, it's going to be right to just recur this from the graveyard and put it on the right creature your opponent controls mm -hmm. to just create the right combat math to kill them. So I might be higher on this card than I should be simply because it's such an interesting design. But at least for the purposes of, like, Arena Cube, I think that this is a really good card. Chris saw Judith in the art, and he's like, I'm in. <laughs> we, had, we had to get Judith <laughs> back in the cube somehow. Yeah, this is just a really, really neat card. I'm interested to see how it plays. And what is kind of becoming a, it's good with Luris, guys. This card is also really good with Inti. Uh, on numerous levels, you know, it gives you a discard card that you can like buy back to keep fueling your Inti. It gives your Inti evasion and makes it big. And like a, a Stiff Breeze is good with Inti. So that's not really relevant. Yeah, it's it's clunky, but this card does say like three mana pay for the discard cost on any of your like discard related things like it can pay for the cost of a blood essentially for for three mana and that that's like a late game there's nothing else going on type thing but i think what chris just mentioned uh you know the kind of push and pull of whether i put this on my own creature or put it on an opponent's creature i think that's the thing that interests me the most with suspect which doesn't come up with stuff like the um the goat the scapegoat because that can only suspect your own creatures but uh th there are definitely times where you know, Menace makes one of your creatures a better attacker, but suspecting an opponent's creature makes all of your creatures a better attacker because now there's no blocker for any of them, you know? Do we have any uh, bargain cards in the cube that you could actually... I, I was wondering if there, were, if there was, like, a way to sacrifice... Like, the first thing that came to throne mind guard. was, like, right... Yeah, throne... Th <laughs> right sure, of Oblivion. Guard, and like a right of Oblivion. Actually. Like, th this, is, this is, like, kind of a freebie. But then you're talking about Mardu. Like, yeah. you're, you're kind of, you're kind of uh, theory crafting at that point. But yeah, my go-to thought was Core Skyfisher, but that card just combos with everything. So. It, we're not putting it in the cube, Teld. I'll wear you down eventually. <laughs> Let's wrap up red with a card I wanted to talk about real quick called Connecting the Dots. It's one in a red for a rare enchantment. Whenever a creature you control attacks, exile the top card of your library face down you can't look at it i like that in uh in parentheses uh one in a red discard your hand sacrifice connect in the dots put all the exiled cards into your hand so there's a lot of card advantage enchantments in this set now i'm thinking about it there's a, like a red red mythic that does something like tangentially related but th this card uh, the quickest way to kind of describe it is it turns all of your creatures into bomat couriers every time a creature attacks no limitation on how many triggers this can get per combat you just stockpile a card and then you turn this into that stack of cards later on by discarding your hand and of course your opponent can't kill your bomat couriers to deny you the cards right as, as long as the enchantment stays in play you get them our real reservation against playing this card was just how brutally good it is con against control when our control decks aren't that good if that weren't a factor do you think we would be trying this card out it does seem like really good red card advantage if you're the aggressor though of course has the downside of like it does nothing <laughs> if you yeah can't i mean attack. you play this on like turn four four turn five and potentially in your like really good draws especially in something like boros you could just you know put like five six counters on this and just immediately like yeah. restock. but then the question is like if you're able to make an attack with five or six creatures like <laughs> you know do you need this well it, it sort of gets past the fact that you're you could make a bad attack right like you could just jam like flunge yeah. and your opponent makes some blocks and like kills two of your creatures right and maybe you even lose them you don't even trade 
you chip in some damage, but like you put five cards, six cards into this. Yeah, and like and now yeah. I like all right. Next turn I'll draw six cards. Cool. And, and that's that's how Bo- Bowmat Courier plays out a lot, right? Is that last attack you're sending Bowmat Courier to his death, but you're just getting one more trigger. I, I think this card is cool. It, it is possibly problematic for yeah. certain matchups in our environment, and I don't know that it makes it in like high powered environments or anything like that but i thought the card was interesting i think my biggest problem with this card is it kind of outlining what i just said is that it is really really good when your hand is strong and probably just snowballs you so hard that you can't lose no matter what you do and it's really really bad when you're when you're not doing that this is a really polarizing card and i don't like the design it's it's another one of those cards too that like if you're on the play it's probably way better yeah well, i like the design well enough it's just like for cube purposes, uh, I, I don't know where it fits exactly, but we're not we're not actually going to test this card out. But I thought it was a neat take on some red card advantage, which there's a lot of in, in this set. But that moves us into green. Would it shock you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if I told you that green got the best card in the set? Well, maybe second best <laughs> card in the set. We we are going to kick off here with a two drop that I think we're all equally excited about. This is Sharp Eyed Rookie. One in a green for a 2-2 two, two rare human detective with vigilance. I didn't realize it had vigilance. Notably has a hat. Yep, it has a hat. It's a real detective and a magnifying glass. They went full stop on this one. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, if its power is greater than rookie's power or its toughness is greater than rookie's toughness, put a plus one, plus one counter on it and investigate. So kind of evolve if you're familiar with the evolve mechanic and uh investigate each time too so we've got like a two mana pelt collector i guess is is the best way to describe it also just spits out clue tokens every time you do this like you trigger this one time you you trigger it one time you play a two this on turn two you play anything with three or more power or three or more toughness and you essentially got a two mana thraben inspector you know two uh two mana three three thraben inspector with vigilance yeah with vigilance and it, it continues to scale from there if you can play progressively bigger creatures. So it's got that Curion Beast Caller vibe too, where it's yeah. like the best two drop you can have for your like beat down decks that are just curving out two drop, three drop, four drop. This card seems excellent to me. Just just very well rounded, powerful card without being too good. Yeah, it's it's got a lot of good play to it. And I actually think it's interesting too, because and maybe there's some pushback on this, but I sort of feel like also it's a little worse in your absolute best draws and better in your more mid draws because playing this on turn two and then playing like a three drop on turn three is really good but in your best draws in green you're going to go one three four five so there's not really room to squeeze this in on curve in your like your nut draw right and so Mm -hmm. i kind of like when they give us cards that aren't just at their best when you're firing on all cylinders they're not they're like a little worse when you're when your deck's doing like the thing i i think that this card and this may be a little controversial i think this card assuming that you play it on curve right i can imagine scenarios where this is not the case but i think if you play this on curve this is more powerful than tireless tracker don't get me wrong there there are games where you're going to crack like three or four clues off of tracker and make it enormous right that does happen Mm -hmm. but in my experience in a lot of games like especially because green generates a lot of card advantage these days. It's like sometimes over the course of a game, like you just don't have more than like two opportunities to crack clues off of tireless tracker. And so like the fact that if you trigger this twice, it's a four, four bidge, which at that point, the vigilance is very relevant for two that generated two clues. I think that's pretty yeah. damn good. So it's it's not fair to compare them directly, but I think sure. if I if I was drafting like certain decks, like I would take this over Tracker. I think. Uh yeah, I mean like I think this card is just generically like Tracker's better in is it better in Jund? Like is Tracker actually better in Jund? Um, because uh, this card like you play this on two right. And like whether your draw lines up aggressive or defensive, because if you're aggressive creature, you're more aggressive creatures like Sentinel of the Nameless City and Questing Beast still trigger this. Your more defensive creatures like Corsair also trigger this. Like, mm-hmm. like it doesn't. The only thing this doesn't play well with is is like Mana Dorks, but even Lanoir Loam Speaker and uh, Armored Scrap Gorger can trigger this. So like, there's a lot of this. This, this card's just awesome, right? Like if your opponent, your opponent has your, your opponent has to kill it or else they're going to go down on card advantage. If they're playing an aggressive deck, it attacks into them while brick walling them at a certain point. Just like really, really good, but also just restrained enough that they didn't give it that LCI treatment of making it like, you know, 
a three, two with, or, you know, what was it, Tim? You said it was initially like a two, one or something. Well, I think it was, um, Carmen, one of the people who does R and D, um, for wizards mentioned on Twitter that like they had to consider whether or not making this a two, one would actually make it a better card because it'd be easier to trigger off a two toughness creature. So like, it's not often a two, two is like worse than the two, one version you could make, you know? Yeah. This card's really good. And it doesn't feel like it'll be oppressive. It doesn't feel like the kind of card that just randomly has a bunch of extra lines of text on it. It, it's got a lot of text, but it's relatively easy to understand and grok. Something about the, the tireless tracker comparison is tire, part of the reason it just feels really good to play tireless con- tracker is that it gives uh it gives value to a draw that otherwise would be like completely dead mm-hmm. or like would yeah. feel terrible. Like it makes your lands better, whereas sharp eyed rookie is making the cards that are already good better. So but they're they're obviously two drop versus three drop. You're you're not making a direct comparison there. Yeah, they they sort of work opposite, right? Like tireless tracker gives you when you draw lands, it gives you cards to draw through those lands, and then when rookie you draw creatures yeah. it gives you clues to Give, crack to you draw, draw lands out of the lands. Play yeah. creatures yeah another quick green one here that's like I, i'm not sure where this one stands in in the larger picture but axbane ferox is two green green for a rare four four beast it has death touch and haste and it has a word cost that makes your opponent collect evidence for so if they target this they have to exile cards from their graveyard with total mana value for or greater. And obviously this is here in the spirit of the other four mana 2GG 4-4 four, four haste creatures like Questin Beast and Ulvenwald Oddity. And I think considerably worse than those. It obviously has way less text than Questin Beast. Like Questin Beast has these two keywords already. If you can make that ward matter or you're in an environment where the graveyard matters a lot for your opponent and they either can't exile cards from their graveyard or that's like a huge detriment to them. I could see a world where this is maybe better than like Ulvenwald Oddity or Questin Beast. For our card pull, it's like clearly tugging at the same reins and uh, I think we're just going to stick with the Oddity slash Questin Beast for the time being. This is just becoming the every set thing, right? The four mana, four four with haste. At least the ward cost is something interesting. <laughs> that, that's that's what I can say. The ward cost. If this just had ward two, I'd be like, whatever. Like, <laughs> you right. know, it is worth noting that there are scenarios in older formats or like Legacy Vintage Cube where your opponent can target this and trigger ward, and if you have something that can exile their graveyard in response, they can't collect evidence and their spell just fizzles. So, like, Endurance comes to mind as, you know, the flash 3-4 that can eat someone's graveyard. That's basically a way to, like, force your opponent to trigger the ward and then like gank their graveyard out from underneath them so they can't actually pay the ward so this is where where you play soul guide lantern and just like sit there and smirk at your opponent oh yeah if you have soul guide lantern on board your opponent can't target this card because you'll just eat their graveyard in response which is kind of cool moving along we've got a just this is another just really quick 10 seconder like the demand answers hard hidden question is a single green mana for a sorcery. It's uncommon. Target creature you control deals damage equal to its power to target creature or planeswalker you don't control. So Rabid Bite for one mana. Also, it's planeswalkers. Not much to discuss here. It's just uh, pushing an effect that we're used to down on the mana curve to the point where it's playable. And uh, that's probably all we need to say about that one. <laughs> it's, it's just decent removal spell. Not top tier, anything like that, but cheap and efficient. Way better than Rabid Bite. And I think that the single mana on it makes it a lot more likely that you can play a creature that can pop another creature on board and also cast this on the same turn. Works with your Dreadhorde Arcanist, guys. Oh, hitting <laughs> hitting planeswalkers too is pretty big upside for you know this this sort of spell most of the fights can't do that yep two more green cards that we, we found to be like maybe competing for the same slot in our cube um does somebody here want to talk about this analyze the pollen card or uh sticky shit as i'm calling it so yeah I'll, I'll take this one because i was the one that had originally brought it up um so analyze the pollen is a single green mana search a library for a basic land card as an additional cost you can pay collect evidence eight If you do that, instead of searching for a basic land card, you can search for a creature or any land card and then put it in your hand and shuffle. So kind of a lower floor, it's just a lay of the land type card. But if you can collect evidence eight, 
it does let you do the Olven Wall, traverse the Olven Wall thing where you can go get a Field of the Dead or you can go get a powerful creature. You can kind of do that. I, I think traverse in more powerful environments, if you want this effect, is probably better because in a lot of those environments, there's a lot of differing card types and you can, you, it becomes easier to enable that. Collect Evidence 8 is a lot, but I think that's easier to pay in a lot of our kind of green decks that are very creature heavy than something like Traverse, where you may have like, you know, two instants or sorceries and like an enchantment or two. Maybe, maybe you've had a hinge. Like, you know, your, your whole deck maybe has five or six non creature spells sometimes. This is just low opportunity cost, high upside whenever you get the like 10% or 20% or where you get to actually collect the evidence, right? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, it's fine when you play it for one mana, you know, and you need a land and you can sandbag it until you have cards in the graveyard. That being said, I was kind of interested in this just as a possibility. And then they spoiled the next card that I think is far more interesting and also really powerful and probably really relevant for Constructed. This is the one I was referring to as possibly the best card in the set. Um, Arch Druid's Charm, which I guess we're we're going to have a cycle now because you know clearly the Archmage's Charm. This one's green, green, green for a rare instant. Choose one. Search your library for a creature or land. Reveal it. Put it onto the battlefield. Tapped if it's a land. Otherwise, put it in your hand and shuffle. Put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature you control. It deals damage equal to its power to target creature you don't control. Third mode, exile target artifact or enchantment. And in the words of my friend Mitchell, is this the most versatile card ever printed? And it might be. I mean, this is good. search for a creature, search for a land, not even a non-basic. If it's a land, put it into play. Plus one, plus one counter synergy. It's a punch effect at instant speed. It's a naturalize for artifacts and enchantments, and it exiles. Like, I know there are only three modes written on the card, but that's, like, functionally five to six different things you can do with this card. Yeah, it doesn't shock me that green just continues to just get its utility creep. That's kind of been green's thing over the past, you know, five years or whatever. Just, like, green does literally everything. And this card, I mean, like, don't get me wrong. Archmage's Charm is a good card, and it sees constructed play. But that card has three modes and that's it, right? <laughs> this card, like, as you mentioned, is just like, <laughs> it's just like six cards in one. There's how many more lines? Of, the, I'm, I'm actually surprised it doesn't say creature or planeswalker on it. The, the, that way it could kill planeswalkers as well. And battles while we're at it. Like, <laughs> yeah. why does it, why does it do all those things? Green, green, green is also like fundamentally easier than blue, blue. Actually, green, green, green is the easiest like triple pipped cost that you can have because your mana dorks will often pay for one of the green and plus when you're green you're heavy green yeah. more often than not i mean my, my question just to wrap this up because this card is obviously really good in formats that have like maybe dark depths that's been stage or um maybe constructed formats that have field of the dead but where does it stand for us is this something you guys think fits the context of our arena cube I would probably play this in every single green deck that I've ever drafted because every green deck I draft plays like, you know, almost exclusive. It's like I'm splashing for whatever I'm splashing, right? If, whether it's Selesnia or uh, Gruul or whatever, I, it's always a splash, right? It's, it's I'm playing, you know, eight sources, nine sources of my off color and like 13, 14 of my main color, not counting dorks um, you, and, and very yeah. frequently. And so like you're just playing so so many green sources that this just does everything. This consolidates multiple different effects you want in your deck into a single card. Cube cube equity, baby. Replace one of your fight spells with this and suddenly you have a ramp spell and a tutor as well in yeah. your and, and a naturalize. So yeah, this, this card's probably going to make waves in Constructed and I'm sure there are a lot of cube environments where it's going to be a top tier card as well. I, I just want to say one last thing. I think this card's a little worse if you're in perhaps... I mean, it's probably playable vintage because there's mono green, but a lot of times your green decks there are playing like um, upheaval decks or they're playing like multicolor green is really common. So it might be a little harder to get triple green because you're not as committed. But the dorks there also, cards like Rophalos and Priest of Titania and stuff produce a ton of green mana. So it might just be trivially there, easy there as well. Not to mention that the Hierarchs and Birds of Paradise produce green in addition to what your potential splash colors are going to be. Yeah. So I actually think that with the number of dorks that produce multiple colors of mana in Vintage Cube, this might actually be easier to cast there than it is for us. So, yeah, it's I don't I don't I don't know that I can necessarily add anything. At the very least, it is an incredibly unique card in green, and I expect it to be good. Chris, do you want to kick off the multicolor section for us here? 
Sure. So the first card we're going to be talking about is Tristani Three Whispers. This is one hybrid Selesnia and a white. It's always so awkward when they put hybrid costs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, anyway, it's a three mana for a four four legendary creature dryad. And uh, I wasn't really sure to how, how to evaluate this at first, but I, I've come to believe that it's actually pretty good. So you can pay one and a green to give target creature death touch until end of turn, a hybrid Selesnia to give a creature vigilance until end of turn, and you can play two and a white to give target creature double strike until end of turn. So when I was first reading this card, I was like, it was hard to evaluate it, right? Because like some of the modes are like a little bit expensive for giving modes, Mm-hmm. But the fact of the matter is, this is going to make combat really, really awkward for your opponent. Especially if you're in the like heavier green version of the Selesnya deck than the heavier white version that's playing a lot of smaller creatures. It's not uncommon in green ramp decks to have some amount of mana in the later game left over at the end of your turn. At which point, like just giving your 6-6 six, six trample like vigilance... Is pretty good. Giving it death touch is or double strike or death touch and double strike is also incredible. <laughs> I was gonna say Chris went for vigilance on the six six double uh, six six right. uh, trampler. <laughs> no, no, what, no, one hundred percent. Like if, if you if yeah. you yeah. top deck a land and you've got nothing to do but you've got a big creature on board and your opponent is either playing something where the removal is probably conditional enough that you're not gonna get blown out. And, and frankly, like even if you do get quote unquote blown out, if you had nothing else to do but to like put these modes under your best creature, they were probably planning on removing your best creature anyway, right? So yeah. if you didn't opt to do this instead of something else, it's not like you really lost out. And and as you guys like, if you just sink five mana into like even even a four four creature with trample like Ulvenwald Oddity, and give it death touch and double strike, like. They can't block it. Like, they can't block it. It'll just eat their entire board. And bear in mind, the base rate is a 3-mana 4-4, which is not, like, a world beater in modern magic. But, like, it's not like this is a 3-mana 2-3 with these modes. This adds significant board presence and then gives you all this utility later. And these modes are just... They get better on bigger creatures, right? Which you're playing in green. So I, I expect this to be good. They kind of made a a cute little design where the mode you have to use proactively only costs you one mana because the other modes you can wait until combat is close to resolving before you activate. And the vigilance mode just costs you one mana. So if you, if you need your creature to be able to, you know, ship and then be block, be able to stay back and block, that's, that's a relatively light tax. So now you're threatening those other modes. I, I really like cards like this that make combat interesting I, I think it does i don't know if my problem with this the one concern i have is does this actually make combat interesting or does this make combat impossible for your opponent i think the second one in a lot of cases and that, that's kind of what my second thought was this first thought was yeah cool keywords awesome yeah it'll make combat fun and then it's like wait <laughs> does this does this just make big creatures just like uninteractable in a, in a way because double strike's also first strike right so if you give death touch and double strike your creature's just killing whoever blocks it right yeah I mean, it is a mana sink, and we don't have a lot of mana sinks. It is nice. Uh, It's something that gets lost in the transition from, like, limited magic to cube specifically is, like, threat of activation effects. You just don't see them. You don't see effects like this in cube because it's not an immediate ETB or anything like that. So those cards don't, you know, see play. So it's kind of the stat line that's carrying this card to the point where we're looking at the activated abilities if this was like a three mana two two with this range of effects it wouldn't be quite enough to hold its own to the point where you would actually care about the abilities but the stat line's three mana four four it is restrictive this is kind of like almost you know exactly a selesnia like mm-hmm. i don't i don't see people splashing this card around very much but it, it's nice to have like some some mana sync some activated abilities that aren't just like here's a good etb here's what my card did so um i i could see a world where this was easily printed as a three mana four four with the ETB like give a creature death touch, give a creature vigilance, give a creature double strike, and I think that would be way less interesting than having this card as like kind of a, a something that influences combat via mana sync, via threat of activation. If you're heavy green or heavy white, you can kind of conceivably splash this, right? It's like you can splash, but 
pe- you're you're overestimating people's ability to care about Selesnia cards in <laughs> like to to want to splash Selesnia cards, you know. Right. Speaking sure. of that, well, one one thing I want to observe is like if you top deck this in the late game on six mana, you can drop it and then like immediately give your biggest creature double strike, right? Yeah. So like. It's a three mana play that if you top it later and you have a board presence can create like immediate value by giving you somewhere to invest your mana. And I also think that mana sinks are at their best in green yeah. when you're working with the most mana, you know? And I- I'll also say this Selesnia cards tend to be really unexciting designs that are like very straightforward. Like look at Tristani, ETB, make two tokens, anthem your board. Like I love that card, but that's not that's not a super interesting effect, right? Voice of Resurgence, I love the card, not particularly interesting. This has got to be one of the Selesnia designs that will provide the most nuanced decisions on what to do with it, and I think that that's a vote in its favor to begin with. Yeah, we'll see how this one does. Uh, Selesnia cards always take a, a hit in our cube by virtue of being Selesnia cards. It's just seen as the the boring color pair, even though I, I think the deck's quite good, but... If you guys don't mind, I'm going to blaze through these next two real quick because they're just like effects. (laughs) The first one is No More Lies, which is white blue for an uncommon instant counter target spell unless it's controller pays three. Uh, Exile that spell instead of putting it into its owner's graveyard. So we've got uh, two two colored mana leak, which to me is an indication that mana leak's not too powerful for standard. So give it to us, you know, give, give us the mana leak. We want that. That being said, if you're on blue white control and for some reason you're still playing... Uh, absorb or something like that stop playing absorb play no more lies if you're on dovin's veto there may be a world where this is better than dovin's veto i guess that that depends on really the context of how control works huge winner for pioneer control blue white control is a good deck there and this is just an absolute banger yeah. for that deck Th- this is huge for constricted constructed uh correct me if i'm wrong but same with the next one lightning helix i think is also being added to pioneer for the first time i believe that's correct it should be big. The only reason I mentioned Lightning Helix here for us is that it is a it has awesome art, and b it's an uncommon for the first time on Arena. Whereas the only Lightning Helix we've had up to this point was the Mystical Archive version, which is a rare, and that does matter for our card pool as far as wild cards and stuff like that goes. So just two two solid little effects in the card pool here. I do really want to talk about this next card because I am still trying to figure out how good it is and i keep going back and forth on it so the card is urgent ne- necropsy necropsy two black green for a mythic instant as an additional cost to cast this spell collect evidence x where x is the total mana value of the permanence this spell targets destroy up to one target artifact up to one target creature up to one target enchantment and up to one target planeswalker so the way this works is let's say my opponent has a three drop creature and a two drop artifact on board i target those things they have a total mana value of five i need to collect evidence five which means i can exile cards from my graveyard with mana value five or greater it really sounds if you read that first line it sounds like you have to get the exact mana value of the things you're targeting but that is not true yeah that requires having the collect evidence reminder text on the card because that does explicitly <laughs> say that you could do more. yeah or great yeah it, it's it's a little confusing just reading it so here's the thing with this card uh, you guys remember the card casualties of war mm-hmm. i think is what it's called black 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 green 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 sorcery destroy like one of each type of permanent i think that one can hit lands too that is a i think exactly the type of card that you would like to have in a cube but the mana cost on that one is just restrictive there are so many board states if you just like join someone's game they're in the middle of turn six you will see a lot of board states where someone has a planeswalker they have something underneath a banishing light there's like an artifact token laying around and of course there are creatures on board and cards like this urgent necropsy and casualties of war and to to an extent farewell are like the only cards that can turn a game around once somebody's gotten in that position and this intrigues me because it's four mana no matter what the collect evidence is it's four mana and it has the potential to kill like three maybe even four permanents depending on how much evidence you can collect and the stuff you're trying to destroy the problem is like 
a consistency issue, right? If your opponent just has six creatures on board and they're attacking you and they're not playing any other periphery stuff, like this this is going to kill maximum one of their things for four mana. But if one of their creatures is an artifact creature, you know, or they have a an anthem on board, like their um, wedding invitation, you know, is sitting around, or they have like a planeswalker, this is the type of card that can just turn a game around that no other card could. So it intrigues me. Because there are spots where it will obviously be like the best card in an entire cube that you can have, but there are also spots where this card just is four mana to kill a creature. No, 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 no. no. So, there's spots where this is literally four mana to do nothing because you have to have cards in your graveyard. And while I yeah, you, you could you, you like, could also assume, not have the evidence to collect. Like we assume that you're going to have something in the graveyard, but that is not that is not a given, right? You could just be getting curved yeah. out on and like don't have anything at all to do, and this is just rotting in your hand. Oh, abs- absolutely. Like if this is the first spell you're casting for the game, like. Good, good luck you know <laughs> you're you're done um you were gonna lose even if this was something else uh, you know a different four drop or something like that but a i don't think the collect evidence thing is that big of a because like you're not going to be hitting 12 mana worth of permanence i mean maybe may, maybe there are games where you will i mean if you're if you're hitting a walker it's going to cost at minimum four but the thing is like presumably you're playing this in like jund or something like that or maybe a soul tie pile I do not think it's that hard to get the collect evidence number up high enough to kill like eight mana's worth of stuff. But if you're running this in Jund or Sultai, you run into a second issue of those decks already wanting their graveyards because you've got cards like Uro, Kroxa, uh, Squee and Slimefoot, sure, Treasure sure, Cruise, yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like there's already so many things in those kind of decks that you want to use for your graveyard, Goif even. I think the buy-in on this card uh, combined with the fact that in some non-trivial number of games, it's going to either kill like a creature or do nothing at all has me really low on this card. I don't think this card is very good at all personally, but I can see spots where it's really good, but I feel like that's magic Christmas land where we're just assuming the opponent's going to line their cards up perfectly into ours. And sure, it's a blowout then, but I think most of the time this card's like or made a doom blade that you had to set up and see like i'm assuming the average position is between what you're saying where like i think this will often frequently be better than like four mana kill a creature and i think calling it like magic christmas land doesn't do it justice because i think you will often be able to engineer situations where this is the card that you want to draw off the top of your library and like it is the card that is going to be responsible for you winning the game because of what it hit and to the to the point of like yes this competes with other graveyard stuff like that that would be completely at the discretion of the like person who's building the deck to not jam a row and treasure cruise and something like this all in the same deck the same way you can't like have your your croaks a phoenix grim lava man sure, like you, you sure. keep, there's a there's a limit to how many of those cards you can put in a the, deck, the, so I those don't, cards I don't... are all better than this card. That, that's exactly what I was going to say. So if you've got <laughs> access to those cards, why are we playing? Why are we playing this sports card? So you made you made the comparison again. That, that's not my point. Not, my point is not comparing this card to Croxa or Uro. My point is like a litmus test for what does a normal game look like for you to be able to collect enough evidence. It, it, the comparison between this and whether this is better or worse than Uro doesn't matter. Like that's not the point I'm trying to make. My point is, like, can you collect the evidence? And I think so. Like, how often do you escape Uro? Not all the time. And what is the total... <laughs> and what... Not all the time, but... And that's counting lands. Majority of the time. And one mana spells. Yeah, but my point is, like, how... how What is the mana value of the cards that you're using to escape Uro? And a lot of time, it's probably, like, four, five, six. You get some lands in there, but you're still exile and non-lands. You never exile Uro, or you never escape Uro or Kroxa with five lands that just doesn't sure. happen there's spells in there but this that happens this card is terrible if your collect evidence is four or five though right it's like you're killing a two drop and a three drop and that's i, I guess that, that's that's fine. Fine. that's that's not that's not ter- that's not like that's not a bare bones bottom like this card's terrible if it's killing a two drop and a three drop. but like we also had to set that up right like it's not like we're killing a two drop and a three drop with just our yeah brain. well th- that's my whole point is like the the inconsistency <laughs> of like the board state and it, it might it might be that like this is the type of card you bring in out of the sideboard where you've seen that there are different types yeah. of permanence and stuff like that. Maybe you don't main deck it, in which case we like we won't we don't run cards that we want strictly as sideboard cards. So I again I'm not sitting here like, oh, we need to play this card. But I think this I think people came out the gate saying this card's awful, this card's terrible, it it requires work, and I think that is extremely I think that is like hugely discrediting how good this card is. I think people have it here, and I know the listener can't see that, and I have it, like, 
here, but then when I say I have it here, people are like, oh, Tim has it up here. And it's like, no, that's not what I'm saying. Like, um, <laughs> you're I'm saying not saying that. that. You're, you're, this is a roundabout way. I think what you're saying is this card does not suck as bad as people think that it sucks. Yes. But I also don't think it's like, oh, you have to put this in every, like... Right. I was about to say, that is not that is not a ringing endorsement. <laughs> it's, it's, it's damning by faint praise, right? It's like, there's... you In our cube, I'm, I'm just going to point out that the one of the handful of Golgari cards that we've run are, like, Glissa, which for three mana has regularly won games by itself. And I know that's not a fair comparison, necessarily, but, like... It's not, spending, so, like... But Glissa, like you're, hold on, hold on. Glissa, three mana, zero setup, and wins the game on its own. This four mana needs setup hopefully is better than a dude kills glissa kills glissa i think that this is worse than maelstrom pulse oh uh, I, I no absolutely not like maelstrom no pulse way. always gets its man and it's cheaper yep. this like, is worse maelstrom than, pulse I, sucks i know chris the, hates assassin's see, that, trophy the, but i think this is the, worse than assassin's trophy too oh assassin's trophy is awful but this is uh which is also in the set by the way assassin's trophy is in the okay, set here's my here's my two cents this is a four mana card it requires specific stuff to be going on board to even have more than one target. It requires you to have enough material in your graveyard to interact with more than one target, which is not guaranteed. It's a four mana card that asks for a bunch of stuff to be going on for me to get four mana worth of value out of it. And like that's not where I want my four mana cards to be. If I'm going to tap out and, and spend four mana worth of tempo on a card, yep. it goddamn better well do four mana worth of shit pretty much every single time. My read on this card is that in some format, it could conceivably be an effective constructed sideboard card against decks that are running a variety of cheap permanents that are very impactful, right? I could see this coming out of the sideboard against very specific styles of deck. I don't think this is a good cube card. And, and I think that's fair. I think, like, your guys' pushback is fair. Again, my, my point is not this card is amazing my point is that there are not tools built into cubes like ours to deal with the board states that have different types of per like that once your opponent has that board state with a planeswalker and a ranger class you you cannot overcome that if you're behind because you cannot pinpoint target every single different type of permanent and i think this type of tool farewell is very similar farewell is like a gotcha catch all type card we don't play cards like that and i think they have more room than people give them credit and for. And those cards also require zero setup beyond the mana to cast them, and they're still not good enough. Yes, I, I yes, I understand. You, again, you you guys are pushing back on like this point that I'm not making. <laughs> I, I feel like I feel like we we've done a lot of talking to indicate that this card doesn't suck as bad as people think that it does, but it's probably not cubable. Did I just summarize it pretty well? No, I, I, I would not say this card is not cubable. That that's not my point. But w let's 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 uh, move on. Let's let's move on from this one. I would like to hear people's feedback on this. Like, if people come out of the woodwork, so like this card is ass. Like, just say it's ass, okay? But my my whole point, the reason I wanted to delve into this one is that I think people believe this card is not cubable, and I believe it is. And uh, we should probably settle at that. Otherwise, we're going to get cyclical here. I think this is your lantern bearer, Tim. I think this might be your lantern. <laughs> lantern bearer was a group effort, for what it's worth. But um, I want to talk about this next card. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead and take it. Let's let's move on to a more interesting topic here. Okay, so I, this has me convinced that the FBI is listening <laughs> to my conversations with Tim because I've been saying for a long time that Corpse Knight should have been a Boros card and it should have had a keyword like Impact Tremors is not good enough, right? Impact Tremors is not good enough. Now, I wanted this effect on a creature, but this is kind of adjacent in terms of its board impact. This is called War Leader's Call. It's one, a red, and a white for an enchantment. Creatures you control get plus one, plus one. So, okay, Glorious Anthem, which is not really good enough anymore. But whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, War Leader's Call deals one damage to each opponent. So, I think that this is one of the more interesting Boros cards that exists. Frankly, for a gold card, and maybe this would have been a little bit too pushed, but frankly, for a gold card, I think this could have cost red-white. But what I like about this card is it is good if you already have creatures on board. And if it's your three-mana play, then over the course of a game, it's going to continue to anthem your board once you develop it 
but also rack up a a decent amount of damage. Yeah, combining these two effects is really nice. Um, you know, like you said, impact trimmers is bad on curve because you aren't contributing your board, so you don't really want to do that. But you might if you put it in your deck. And then Glorious Anthem is also not usually very good on three because you don't get immediate value or any way of recovering mm-hmm. it until you get creatures in play. And this kind of gives you, if you already have creatures in play, you know, your impact tremors is now pumping your board. If you don't, if you're playing it on curve, it gives you a little bit of extra equity to try and like catch up for the fact that you took a tempo loss to put your glorious anthem into play before you had creatures, which is, is nice. Right. So we, we just added a Neem Pakal, which I think is a really interesting rabble master variant, which is why we added it. And it has a potential to snowball really, really hard. I think this effect is more interesting and in a lot of red sections and white sections, you're just going to have kind of a glut of excellent three drop creatures to choose from. And this is a three drop if you end up in Boros or Naya tokens that provides a legitimately different and potentially more powerful effect. <laughs> and I'm going to go on record and say that with the combination of us adding Delny and adding this, I want to bring Angel of Mention back, but we'll fight about that off air. I was going to ask what bring back Angel means, but... <laughs> yeah, no, that, 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 that's exactly what it means. So I, I feel like there's not a whole lot to say about this card. It's possible that three mana is not enough, but I like that it's a three mana card that impacts the board if you already have a board presence. And pays you if you play it early and still anthems your board one thing i will say if you do have this card in delny in your deck which i agree they kind of go in similar decks is be careful because this probably turns off almost all of your cards triggering off delny because they're going to be two power creatures that get bumped to three totally. yeah that, that's that's worth mentioning with um delny we probably should have mentioned is that it's kind of a non-bow with the anthems with certain creatures but i did want to say that, that, that uh war leaders call is also like gotta be like one of the biggest groans to see on the opposite t- side of the table when your opponent just curves out and like you don't have a good answer for their aggro start because mm-hmm. they're, they're just going to push in the extra damage that turn you're going to sweep and then your life total is going to be like six and you're like i'm just going to die to yep. whatever other additional creatures they play you know right. whether i can answer them or not it's it's a bad position to be in against cards like impact tremors when you're sitting at five and you're not pressuring your opponent they're gonna play a gutter dweller and dome you for three and put like you know seven like seven yeah. power to play <laughs> you're gonna be like well I guess one way to look at this card is that because Impact Tremors costs one in a red, right? Yeah. This is like Impact Tremors that also plays a glorious anthem for one extra mana. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, th- this is just a good design. This is just good design. Yeah. Chris, why don't you take the next one too? Because I think uh, you've been trying to make fetch happen here with a uh, blue green flash. So, <laughs> okay. So this next card is Repulsive Mutation. It is X green blue. Put X plus one plus one counters on target creature you control, then counter up to one target spell unless its controller pays mana equal to the greatest power among creatures you control. So this doesn't fit in our current cube. There just isn't quite enough support for green to pair well with blue aggro control cards. I think maybe if we had one more good green flash threat and maybe a good Simic flash threat that's not Mystic or Serpentine Mystic or whatever that card is called, like an actually powerful Simic flash card, I think I'd be interested in this. The only reason that I wanted to bring it up was if Simic flash is ever going to happen as an archetype and tells us of the opinion that it won't, and that's entirely possible, I'm not pushing back on that. This is exactly the type of card that I want to see for that. It, I think it's cool. It feels very green and it feels very blue at the same time. It, it feels like a nice marriage of what these two colors are are doing. And uh, I'm into it. Notably also, like just as a X equals zero mode, even if you don't put any plus one plus one counters on anything, like if you have a creature on board, this is like basically always mana leak, right? It also means if they kill the creature you're targeting, if you do pay and you have another creature, like that other creature still counts towards whatever they have right. to pay. Right. So like you this it doesn't have to be X equals anything. Like that's just kind of upside. If you have like mid sized creatures on board, this is just like counter target spell unless your opponent pays three or four. I just wanted to call this out as a design is like exactly what I want to see for that type of deck and a, and a card that if you are doing that in your cube and some people are doing it in their cubes especially like in in peasant there are some playable like five mana flash threats that are actually quite good i think this is a card you because it is an uncommon i think this is a card you could look at this is just a sweet design We're, our our cube context is just not ready for it yet yeah cool card it asks you to play something that's never going to be viable outside of extremely low power level but it is a cool card so 
real quick, let me touch on the surveil lands because there's a cycle of fetchable surveil lands in this um, set. We, we're I don't think we're going to play any of them. They can add like niche little amounts to a strategy. They do have land types, but there's all ten of them. They enter tap. They tap for one of two colors, and they have um, you know they're fetchable. They're like the meticulous archive is a plains island when they enter the battlefield. Surveil one. So if you're still on scry lands for some reason, like this is just. 99% of the time a strict upgrade and if like land types matter these probably are more interesting to you but um, it's just another set of lands in the card pool to work with which is always nice they're just better than the temples oh a lot better yeah, yeah the, the, the temple well, that, they're not strictly better but they are better um smuggler's copter though is the last card we want to talk about which is a known factor okay so what happened was this card is on the list it was not originally on the list because it's not on the paper version of the list but because it was unbanned in pioneer and not present on explorer they needed to find a way to get it onto the arena platform so they just replaced a card in the list on arena with smuggler's copter which means ba bam we have smuggler's copter on arena discuss all right it's one of the best aggressive cards ever it does everything it's ridiculous it's awesome it's it's stupid just i, I expect this to be a card we play for a month and then people are like please i want to stop dying to smugglers copter this card was banned in standard it was banned in pioneer for a while they just unbanned it it's it's already showing up all over the place and it's completely changed the best decks in the format to be way more aggressive so it's gonna be great yeah I think it, it's kind of funny. It's continuing the now storied trend of the colorless cards we get on the arena client are either total dog shit or potentially problematic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you think, um, Chris, do you think we're cutting this card a, a month from now? I, I don't know. We'll have to see. But a 3-3 three, three flyer that fixes your draws and only costs one to crew seems strong <laughs> i'll yeah. put it that way I, I will say clearly magic has gotten to the point where wizards feels like this card was unbannable so that that says something about people's mentality at least the designer's mentality about where this stacks up against modern day magic cards and two this card in our cube in particular has a lot more answers than it did in let's say it's standard format where it got banned where like you either fatal push it or you die to it so you know we have like our portable holes and a lot of instant speed interaction the one thing is it, it dodges sweepers and sorcery speed interaction so yep. that that is kind of the thing that will make it problematic if it ends up being a problem which to tell its point this could totally end up being <laughs> being a problem and remember people your uh smuggler's copter triggers on blocks too for some reason just remember that pro tip <laughs> Okay, so that puts a wrap on all of the new and uh, you know new cards and reprints here. We are going to get into some overall impressions of Murders at Karlov Manor. We'll each kind of go through and give everybody our take on the set as a whole and how it affects Cube. I, I guess I'll go ahead and kick this off here. I do think the set overall feels fairly parasitic. And you'll you'll notice uh, we we spent some time talking about car, uh, mechanics like disguise and cloak, and then didn't even really mention them in the context of the cards we talked about because they're just not interesting cards for cube, right? I do think suspect is interesting. Um, I, I we only talked about two suspect cards, one of which can't even target your opponent's stuff, but the mechanic itself I think is a nice decision making mechanic. It might come out in the wash that like you're always supposed to suspect your opponent's creature or you're always supposed to suspect your own creature. But I think there are implications about choosing, you know, to make your creature a worse blocker versus making your opponent's creature a better attacker to try and push damage. I think there's interesting stuff there. And obviously, uh, you know, as as showcased by my <laughs> my defense of the black green card, I do think collect evidence is a cool graveyard mechanic. Not quite like Delvey. But delve adjacent, uh, it does feel like they tried to check off a checklist of like cons of Tarkir things, but like the 2024 version of the cons of Tarkir things, and that's kind of what collect evidence feels like. I am a little annoyed that the name is so specific that like we just won't see that used again outside of another detective set or whatever. But yeah, I, the, as far as the mechanics go, there's not a lot of the new mechanic mechanical stuff impact in our queue, but there's still some good one-off cards. I do like Ravnica as a backdrop for the murder mystery set. I, I think it's cool to have like these thematic sets that are focused on events rather than world building, and it doesn't make sense to create an entire new world 
for, you know, a murder mystery. So it makes sense that they used Ravnica as the backdrop. I think it works. I don't think they like shoehorned it in last minute because Capenna wasn't popular or whatever people are talking about. Last thing I'll say here, I'll, I'll throw it to you guys, is Ward. I am sick of Ward. Uh, the fact that it's just tied into one of the other mechanics in the set, like, bothers me. Like, the fact that removal just has to be bad and every creature has to be able to do the thing it was designed to do in order for, you know, people to play those cards. I just don't like it. And part of the reason it bothers me is because Ward is also just used on a bunch of other cards in addition to the disguise creature. So uh, I think I mentioned it with the LCI. It's going to be rampant here because of all the disguise creatures. I'm just done with Ward. Like, use it conservatively. Like, a couple creatures per set with Ward is fine. You don't need it on every single threat. So that that's where I'm at with Murders at Karlov Manor. Tell, do you want to go ahead and uh, pick it up from there? Yeah, so um, this set looks like a nice lower power set for Retail Limited, which is a nice break after a couple of the last sets have been really, really powerful. I found fewer rares that I, I complain about than normal, but it, it, it could just be the case that somebody has suggested that LCI just hurt me too badly to uh, to be able to accurately judge cards in their context. Those cards, those, those rares were just so egregious and powerful that it makes cards that are probably going to be very, very good in this set just look very tame by comparison. It's really cool, though. I agree that Ravnica has a really cool backdrop of the plane. And it's nice to get a different flavor rather than the 300th variation of here are the 10 guilds, guys. It's obviously a multicolor set because there was never going to be getting away from that. But it did feel like they implemented different parts of Ravnica rather than just having the the, the guilds. It, it, it was weird to have like 100 multicolor cards and then not have a cycle of common dual lands. That, that felt like something we would get mm. as a given. And, and I have to admit, as this set's really cool. I think it'll be fun. It's like Constantar Cure meets 2024 but I'm, I'm also so unbelievably ready for cowboy wild west plane that uh you know I, i'm ready for i'm ready for the cowboy hat memes as opposed to detective hat memes uh you know i i don't want to like poo poo this set because i think it's really cool and i am actually excited lots of neat designs but i'm ready for thunder junction that's the the set i'm most excited about for the year i'm just I'm, i've been waiting like a very long time for that set <laughs> For me, I'm going to echo that I think that there are too many mechanics and the names for those mechanics are like a little dorky. And I don't think most of them are exceptional for cube. It is kind of refreshing to get a lower power set after LCI. That being said, like if anyone who curates a uh, really high power level cube is listening to this review, they probably spent the entire episode going like, why the fuck are they wasting breath on this card? <laughs> if you have a higher power cube, this set likely didn't give you much of anything to get excited about, which I think is fine for that to happen occasionally. I think a lot of people have, e even people who curate like high power level cubes, I've seen people say on Reddit that they have like a lot of fatigue around like every set containing some new power creeped banger that they feel like they have to play. So I guess this will give people who have new card uh, exhaustion a little bit of a nice break. The most interesting thing about the set to me is that we got a lot of like interesting kind of atypical effects in red that I simultaneously think are good enough for us. The, the aura, the goat, the investigate scaling anti-creature fireball. There's just like some cool designs for red that aren't really like any of the cards we already had access to. And I, and I like that a lot because that's not particularly common. Yeah, we always talk about how every red card is the exact same card. And that did feel like this was not the case not the case. Whether or not that scapegoat card is good enough for your cube, it is probably one of the most interesting red one drops ever printed in terms of what it does. So yeah, yeah, there's some cool red stuff going on, and and that's basically it. Low power with cool card design, which is effectively the polar opposite of what LCI was. Yeah, I will say I'm looking forward to the next time we see this mechanic when we get super duper disguise and it comes, you know, when Invisible. you flip your, when you flip your disguise creature, it gets a plus one, plus one counter. <laughs> uh, oh, Megam, yeah, you're the Megamorph nod. Yeah, I think what Chris said uh, compared to LCI in particular, LCI really pushed some just absolutely egregious threats. And I think this, this set pushed some effects, like just slightly pushed effects. Like we see the, the blue white mana leak. We see rabbit bite at one mana that hits planeswalkers. We see thrill of possibility power crept slightly. We see 
eliminate, you know, strictly better eliminate. We see surveil lands instead of scry lands. Like, instead of, like, making just ridiculous threats, which would they already have from LCI, we got, like, just a tiny little nudge for a couple different effects. And whether those make your cubes or not, it is just, uh, it's it, it feels like natural power creep rather than, like, oh, the red draw spell is just one in a red draw two cards at instant speed or something like that, you know? So... I like the the tiny little pushes here, and only, I mean, not a very bomby set either in terms of, like, here's must-play cube cards that are just absolutely ridiculous, which is what LCI felt like through and through, partly because all the threats in LCI were, like, two or three mana, (laughs) which is kind of pushing it, but just to wrap up, is there a favorite card that you guys are looking forward to cubing with here? Convenient target for me, just to see how good it is, because it could just be dorky, but... There's this feeling in my gut that could end up actually being not only really unique in red, but like pretty powerful. I think that was a, one of the more intriguing designs. I kind of latched onto it early and it's just been um, sitting around rent free in my head for a while trying to think about it. It's kind of the sleep cursed fairy of the set for me. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's a cool one because it's it's not doing something that any of the other red cards in our section actually do. I, I'm personally interested in the factor fiction. Like, I would love for a blue draw spell to actually make it <laughs> in a cube environment and i think that card has the numbers and the the costs that it needs to have to make to put card draw back on the table like <laughs> mm-hmm. like make make card draw good again or whatever um whatever i gotta put on my my hat anyway that's gonna go ahead and wrap things up thanks as always to everyone who is listening remember best way to support jank diver gaming and the jank tank is to join the discord server come draft with us give us your feedback Great place to hang out with like-minded individuals, talk about Q, Retail Limited. There will almost certainly be a lot of Retail Limited talk when Murders of Karlov Manor actually comes out on Arena. The times, actually, it looks like I need to go through and adjust the times. But we actually added a lot of um, scheduled events to our server due to the yeah. high demand for those events. So now we're drafting... On Fridays at 7.30, that's kind of a who's who, whatever you guys want to vote for, come out, hang out, and draft, you know, whatever the populace wants to do. Saturday and Sunday at 2.30 Eastern, and Saturday and Sunday at 7.30 Eastern, we have a drafts uh, across all four of those scheduled times as well. And uh, Wednesday Wednesday as well. Don't forget about Wednesday. So I, it looks like I'm going to have to adjust my um, my outro reading here to <laughs> reflect all that. But uh, there's a lot of Cuban going on with six scheduled events per week right now. We'll see, you know, uh, who, who, how, how consistent those fire and adjust from there. But we wanted to um, meet the demand of all the new people coming in. And if you want to be one of those new people, find the Discord link wherever you're listening to this. Come hang out. And at the very least, say hi. Let us know what you thought of the episode. Let us know what you think of any particular or like black green cards that may or may not have been mentioned on the episode. Uh, you can find our socials, uh, Twitter at jankdivergaming, youtube.com slash jankdivergaming, and you can find Teld streaming some Magic the Gathering at twitch.tv slash Teld Talks, T-E-L-D Talks. Be careful if you are uh, someone who is diagnosed with high sodium. Uh, it would probably be a bad idea. <laughs> Salt King. Salt Salty stream. King. With all that being said... Thanks to everybody who's listening or watching, and we will catch you all next time. All right, so it says you have a quick sign-off? Yeah, just real quick before uh, we sign off, I wanted to... Uh, th- this is more like a, a selfish sign-off, but uh, my, my, my son, um, Rome, is turning one year old on Friday, less than a week. Congratulations, from... man. Yeah, yeah, dude, it's crazy, because... <laughs> I think, so Chris, the last time I saw Chris was outside Get Some Game, and I think I had already had Rome by then. That was kind of like my goodbye to everybody. But previously, the last time I I had hung out with Chris, I I don't think Rome was even born at that point, just to kind of give a time frame of like how much (laughs) has happened in a year. But um, yeah, my my child is turning one, and I just want to say like, he's like the best thing that's ever happened in my life. Um, And the only reason I want to say that is because like, it may, maybe one day when when dad is like big magic personality or something he can go back and listen to our episodes and i can just say happy birthday to him on the on this episode so i um, looking forward to seeing how he handles being around <laughs> all the people here um he's a little closed in unfortunately given our circumstances but uh happy birthday to rome so has um would you say that being a dad has increased your ability to drop uh, excellent humor from time to time the dad jokes really mm-hmm. coming to you 
No, they they that was always there. <laughs> that 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 didn't that didn't change at all when I became a dad. It was already seated in my brain. But yeah, can confirm. Happy birthday. <laughs> Check in. Check it, check, check, checking it out. The, the empire is expanding. He wasn't, he wasn't supposed to, he, he, I, we had a deal, Tim. Oh, wear you down eventually. They're, they're just all dumb. <laughs> they're just all bad detectives. I don't make good sounds. You're a detective now. I got a saga for you. Yes. Hi, Drix and Roja. How are you doing? My dog is fucking harassing me.